So I think we're live. Uh, I'll just wait for the 15 second delay on the YouTube just to confirm. Uh, looks like it. Okay, cool. Um, so this is London Bitcoin Devs, um, or the Bit the Bit Devs Socratic Seminar. Um, we're live stream on YouTube, um, so please be aware of that for the guys on the call, guys and girls on the call. Uh, we're using Jitsi, which is open source, free, and doesn't collect your data. So check out Jitsi if you're interested in doing similar conversations or Socratics in the future. Uh, today, we'll be doing a Socratic seminar. Obviously, for those who haven't previously attended a Socratic seminar, they originated in New York and the bit devs in New York. Uh, there's a number of people on the call who've previously attended them. But uh, the emphasis is on discussion, interaction, and feel free to have questions and move the discussion onto whatever topics you're interested in. Uh, this isn't a formal presentation by, certainly not by me, but uh, but not even some of the other experts on the call. Um, this is this was set up because we have uh, Kevin Lurk and Anton Ponzo presenting next week on uh, Revolt, which is their Vault design. Um, so that will be live streamed as well next week, and that will be more of a uh, formal presentation structure and Q and A uh, rather than uh, rather than today, which is more of a discussion. So yeah, the topic is. Uh, covenants, check, template, verify. Uh, Jeremy Rubens just joined the call, which is fantastic. And also, uh, in the second half, we'll focus on vaults, and which is one of the use cases of check, template, verify. So what we normally do is we start off by doing intros, a very short intro. Uh, introduce yourself. You can raise your hand if you want to do an intro. Um, but introduce yourself, how much you know about uh, covenants and vaults, um, yeah, and, and we'll go through the people on the call who do want to introduce yourself. You don't have to if you don't want. So can I have a volunteer for someone to introduce themselves? Uh, I don't have a name, but fellow Jitser has just put their hand up. Another thing, if you're speaking um, and you're happy to have the video turned on, make sure you turn the audio and the video on. It'll be better for the video if people can see who's speaking. If you don't want the video on, obviously don't turn the video on. But uh, if you don't care, then then switch the video when you're speaking. So we'll go to a uh, fellow Jitsi. I don't know who that is, but uh, please do your intro. I think that might be me. Um, so I'm Brian Bishop, Avanti CTO, a Bitcoin developer. Uh, I've worked on Bitcoin vaults. I had a little bit of a prototype release recently. I'm also working with a few others on the call here on two manuscripts related to both uh, covenants and vaults. And then I also did an implementation of my vaults prototype with uh, Jeremy's BIP 119 object template verify uh, proposal. Uh, cool. Thank you for that, Brian. Who wants to go next? I think Spencer raised his hand. Let's go, Spencer, next. Yep. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, we can see you on here. Cool. Okay. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Yep. So my name is Spencer. I'm currently a Bitcoin developer at Fidelity Center of Applied Technologies Blockchain Incubator. Um, I've been working on Vaults ever since the summer of 2018. Uh, more specifically, working on a hardware solution using pre-signed transactions with deleted keys. I'm also working with Brian Bishop on those manuscripts as well. Awesome. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, who wants to go next? Otherwise, I'll pick. I'm assuming Kevin's happy to do the intro. So let's go, Kevin, next. All right. Can you see me, hear me? Yeah, I think it's Yeah, fine. both are good. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, so I'm Kevin Loeck. Um, I am probably the least uh, technical on this call. <laughs> um, so I've been interested in covenants and vaults um, actually not too long ago. Um, I, my interest was really raised um, with the first proposal that Brian uh, sent to the mailing list so about like, I don't know, seven months ago. Um, and uh, yeah, so I started, it started picking up my interest then. Um, and so I've been really working on it since December this year uh, when a client of ours had a specific need where they wanted a multi-party uh, vault architecture for their hedge fund. 
Um, so that's really when I started digging and, and exploring different type of architecture. Um, so now, yeah, I'm working on this project we call Revolt, um, which is a multi-party vault um, architecture that's a little bit different from um, the one that the other guys here are uh, working on. Um, but it also has a lot of similarities, so I think it's going to be a very interesting, uh, very interesting talk today. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, I think Max is happy to go next. Yeah, yes, hi there. I'm Max. Uh, I do, I'm mainly a user of Bitcoin technologies um, and contributing uh, some to open source projects too, mainly Wasabi Wallet. Um, I've been always interested in the different uh, property rights definitions that the Bitcoin script can enable uh, and uh, specifically multi-signatures, which was part of my bachelor thesis uh, that I wrote. Um, and I've been following vaults specifically on the mailing lists, um, some transcripts uh, by Brian uh, and the very, very awesome utxo.org uh, that Jeremy put up. Uh, and uh, just interested in the topic in general. So looking forward to this conversation. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you, Max. Uh, anybody else? I'm assuming Jeremy is happy to do the intro. Should we go Jeremy next? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremy. Um, thanks for the intro before, though. Um, so you know a little bit about me. Um, I've been working on BIP 119 Check Template Verify, which is a new opcode for Bitcoin that's going to enable uh, many new types of covenant uh, and smart contract. Uh, one of those uh, use cases is vaults. Uh, so I've released some code um, that's in, uh, it's probably linked in uh, on uh, utxos.org somewhere. You can you can see there's a vault implementation that um, you, know, you can check out um, based on Check Template Verify, um, but I'm currently working on uh, implementing better tools for being able to use check template verify um, that will make uh, oh is having a little bit of trouble. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, that will hopefully make it uh, a lot easier for people to implement uh, all types of vaults uh, in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so we'll go to open noms next. And I think after that, there's no one else who wants to introduce themselves. Sorry, I'm trying to raise my we'll hand. Go open arms. Hi. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. yeah Whoever's speaking. Uh, okay. Uh, open arms, you'll be next. There's someone cool. speaking. You go. We'll do open arms afterwards. Sorry, I was having some trouble with my with my system. Um, my name's Sam. I'm also working on vaults uh, as well with Brian and, and, and Spencer over at Fidelity. Um, I don't have a lot of experience. I'm, um, I'm pro I probably have the least amount of experience with respect to vaults. Um, so this is part of me, uh, kind of gaining more exposure, but happy to be here. Cool. Thank you. Uh, open arms. Yeah. Hi, you know me as, uh, open arms. Yes. Um, I'm working on mainly implementing some new services in a, in a full node script collection called the rest of it. I'm generally, I'm a Bitcoin and lightning enthusiast and very, uh, enthusiastic about privacy as well. Um, don't know a lot about uh, votes, but very enthusiastic, very, you know, glad about hearing more and want to learn more. So, you know, looking forward to this conversation. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Open Noms. There is one fellow Jits here, otherwise, uh, so we'll do you next, who's raised their hand, and then we'll move on. So, fellow Jitsi, you haven't been named, but you've raised your hand. No, give you five seconds. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacob, and I'm working with Brian and Spencer and Bob on the vaults manuscripts that were mentioned in the mailing list not long ago. Um, I'm a PhD student at King's College London, and I've been working on this for about a year and a half. So, yeah, happy to be here talking about all this. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so now we've done intros, we'll start off with basics. Uh, so Michael, these questions. Hello, Michael. Oh, hello. Hi, it's, hello. I just wanted to mention I'm here. It's Adam. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's Adam Gibson here. Hey, Adam. Yeah, uh, Waxwing on the internet. I, I, I don't have any specific uh, uh, knowledge about this topic, but I'm very interested. So I'll, I'll let you get on. Thanks. Cool. Thanks, Adam. Um, okay, so ba uh, basic questions. These are for the uh, beginners and intermediates, and then we'll move on to discussion for the more of the experts on the call. So to begin with, what is a covenant, um, and what problem is a covenant trying to solve? 
we have some hands up to answer that question? I'm not seeing any hands. I can. Uh, Bob. I can try and give uh, it a sorry. try. I didn't introduce myself. Um, I'm Bob McElrath, also working with uh, Brian, Spencer, and Sam on uh, a draft which will appear very soon, hopefully a week or so. You guys will be able to read it. Um, so I have a talk about this topic. If you guys are interested, uh, last summer in Munich, if you go, my name, Mikhail Rath in Munich, there's a there's a whole talk about like why covenants and kind of going through um, the, the various mechanisms. A, a covenant by definition is a restriction on where a UTXO goes next, right? So when I, when I sign a UTXO, I, I provide a signature which proves that I control it and it's mine, but I don't have any control over where it goes after that, right? So a covenant by definition is some kind of restriction on the, the following transaction. Um, now with that, uh, you can create uh, what's commonly called a vault and a vault uh, basically says, okay, the following transaction has to go to me one way or another. Um, so I'm gonna separate my wallet into a couple of pieces, one of which is gonna be somewhat more secure than another. Uh, and when I send to myself, so let's say between hot and cold or between like an active wallet or something like that, um, this has to go to me. So I'm making a restriction on the transfer of the UTXO that says, uh, if you get into my wallet, you can't directly steal this UTXO just by signing it, right? Because the covenant enforces that it has to go to me next. And from there, I can send it on. So I'm, I'm introducing a couple layers of complexity uh, into my wallet to do that. Does that answer your question? It certainly does. Uh, a sophisticated answer. <laughs> um, I don't know if... Uh, so any any of the beginners, intermediates, did, did you understand that uh, answer? And uh, what were your initial... Uh, what was your initial understanding of covenants before before this? Or any questions for Bob? Can I can I raise a question there? And I think this has been an open question since the early days of these ideas. Is um, it's such an obscure name. It doesn't. It doesn't really <laughs> immediately jump out at you what it is. I mean, I, I appreciate the explanation, Bob. That's excellent. But uh, the name. Well, is we can blame um, Eamon Gunsayer and his his collaborators for that. So they wrote <laughs> the paper in 2016, and they named it Covenant. So it's all their fault. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's actually. I mean, I know it's a fun game to blame Eamon for, for things, <laughs> but the, the term Covenants existed before before that in in a Bitcoin context. Yeah, I, I think that the the historical. Um, like, uh, you know, reason is that covenants are something that you use when you transfer property of, and it kind of restricts how it can be used. In uh, the Bay Area where I live in San Francisco, um, you know, there's sort of a dark history with covenants where like they were used to prevent like black people from owning property where they'd be like, you can sell this house, but not to a black person. And that was a, a relatively common um, like, you know, when, when people talk about covenants, they oftentimes have weird things in their deeds where it's like, you can only ever use this property to house uh, 25 artists and then you sell a property with the covenants and the person can't ever, you know, remove these covenants from the property. And that that's also why I think, um, you know, there was some mention in the notes that people didn't really like covenants early on is covenants is inherently a loaded term. It, it was a term that was come up with to, I think, cast some of the stuff in a negative light because people mm -hmm. don't like covenants. Uh, just like, not in the Bitcoin context or, you know, cryptocurrency context, but just in general covenants, people have a negative association with of somebody else controlling your own property. Now in the Bitcoin context, I think as Bob pointed out, um, I, I liked his description. It is about you controlling your own property. Um, one of the metaphors that I like to use for this is right now, um, you know, each UTXO is a little bit like a treasure chest. And you open it up and it's filled with gold coins. And then you get to do whatever you want with those gold coins, put them wherever you want. But then imagine one day you opened up your treasure chest and then you found Jimi Hendrix's guitar in it. And where, where do you store that? Can you take that and throw that in the back of your Subaru? Like, no, no, this is like a sacred thing. It's got to go into a guitar case. And so there's a restriction on if you open up a treasure chest and it says, hey, look, this is a guitar. You can only put this into another suitable guitar case. That's sort of what a covenant is doing, is telling you what are safe containers for you to move your uh, you know, your item from um, to another. And it turns out that for the most part, it, we're still talking about using coins. So it would be, hey, these are coins, but they're made out of uranium. So you know, you've got to put them into a lead box. OK, great. Now we know it's got to go into a lead box. That's the safe next step, um, so on and so forth. So I, that, that, that's one of the metaphors I think that, that works for covenants. It's about you being able to control the safety um, and movement of your own coins. 
Awesome. Uh, Max, I think Max wants to speak. Uh, yes, so, so I know the term covenants uh, from the incumbent banking system, uh, where if you have a, a loan uh, contract, uh, for example, the bank to a company, then the, com the bank can make the requirement that, for example, if the company's cash flow uh, to equity ratio drops to a certain level, uh, then the debt has to be paid back uh, or it has to be renegotiated. Um, so basically, it's a, a limitation on the contract where the, the contract itself is either terminated or changed when one of these uh, things uh, comes into place. Uh, and this, like seeing it as a restriction somewhat also makes sense in the Bitcoin term, right? We, we have a Bitcoin contract that is if you have the private keys to this address, then you can spend it. But in this restriction that it has to go into this other address or into the Max cut off there, did he? This Max cut action. off. And it... Yeah, yeah, we lost him. Action um, setup. Um, so I do think that the term actually does make uh, somewhat of a sense in previous context. Okay, well, you, you, you uh, dropped off for a bit there, Max, so we didn't hear the second half of your answer. Um, do you want to repeat? We heard the first half. I think it might okay. be better to uh, move on. Okay, let's move on. Um, so anything else on... Okay, so I did, I think some of you have already seen this. I did create a paste bin uh, for some of the resources that we can talk through. Um, that is on the Twitter and on the meetup page, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm thinking I may share my screen. Um, but the the very first link that I that I linked to was, and I got a bunch of these link, links from uh, Jeremy's interview on Chaincode Labs' podcast, which is I thought was excellent. Um, and Jeremy talked about some history in terms of implementing covenants on Bitcoin. So the first one is an early Bitcoin talk post on how covenants are a bad idea. Um, perhaps we can talk a bit about why people thought covenants were a bad idea back in 2013 and what progress has been made since then that perhaps has changed their mind or perhaps they still think covenants are a bad idea. Anyone want to take that? So, I mean, I'll start off right now. I mean, as I recall, that was a Greg Maxwell post, right? Yep. When Bitcoin that was, yeah, yeah, I mean, I've yeah. talked with him about that and, and without um, corrupting what his opinion actually is too much, I think the major concern was mainly about recursive covenants. And people like using them and like not really understanding how restrictive a recursive covenant really is. That was the main concern, not that covenants are actually awful, but it like unintentionally um, reads as do not use covenants under any circumstance, um, which is unfortunate, but that was not the intention of the post. Greg, Greg has explicitly, and this is in IRC somewhere, he's explicitly said something to the tune of, I don't know why everybody thinks covenants are bad. Like covenants are fine. I've never said anything about them being bad. And I said to him, well, Greg, everybody I talk to says that they think it's because you said that they're bad in this thread. Like, if you don't think they're bad, you should like make that clear. But, you know, you can't make Greg, you know, write something. But he has written that in IRC that like he doesn't really have any hangups or holdups about them. He doesn't want it's not just it's not even the recursion. That's that's the problem. It's virality. He doesn't want a covenant system that somebody else is doing something. And then all of a sudden your coins accidentally get wrapped up into into their um, you know covenant. It may be recursion as a part of that, but that's I think the the major concern um, with the ones that, that Greg was looking at. There's kind of two elements here, isn't oh, uh, let me uh, there's uh, there's kind of two elements here. There's one timing, and perhaps it was just way too early to start thinking about implementing covenants back in 2013. I don't know if that's the case. And then secondly, uh, there's perhaps views on if the, the ideas on covenants were stupid or too complex back then, that it was just a case of like battening down the hatches and making sure some crazy covenant ideas didn't get into Bitcoin. Um, any thoughts on that or any of the previous conversation? Not seeing well, any I think anytime yeah. you do a covenant, um, I mean, any agreement you make when you're sending funds with the receiver is a private agreement. You can make whatever terms you want, right? The the question I think, and you know, so Greg's post, um, you know, enumerates a 
frankly, particularly bad idea where one party can impose a restriction on another party against their will. Um, which, you know, I, I think most people would think is a, is a terrible idea. Uh, it's not that covenants themselves are a bad idea. You know, if you agree to it and I agree to it, um, fine. Uh, but, you know, I, I think for the most part, uh, covenants are most useful for things where there's not, it's not a two-party arrangement. It's a one-party arrangement, right? Um, because once you get two parties involved, you know, everybody has to understand what's going on. Um, you know, by default, it can't be a regular wallet. The structure of the scripts have to change somehow, and I have to know about those rules. Um, and as long as I agree to them, I, I think that's, you know, completely fine. Actually, a, a hard, hard disagree on that note. Um, one of the major benefits of Covenant system actually comes into the play with like Lightning Network related stuff. It actually dramatically simplifies the protocol um, and, uh, increases the routability by improving uh, the like number of HTLCs that you can have um, and the smart contracts that can live underneath a lightning channel feasibly with reasonable latency. So but I actually I think we actually that, agree there. Yeah. If, so, you know, uh, if you're using a lightning wallet, you've agreed to those rules, right? If, if those rules get yes. implemented, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I, I do agree that like there's a huge amount of value when it's a single party system, but multi multi party things uh, are actually really useful in covenants because uh, the auditability of those protocols is just simpler. Um, and so a lot of the setup things are, are you're writing, you know, half the amount of code. Okay. Any other thoughts on that or we'll move on? I'm not seeing any hands. So move on. Uh, so the next couple of links that, uh, I put up was one, uh, a good intro for, uh, beginners to this topic, which is Aaron Van Verden's a Bitcoin Magazine article on Secure the Bag. So this was after Jeremy's presentation, Scaling Bitcoin. Uh, the Chaincode Labs podcast that I've just seen, Greg's post. And then there's this paper by, uh, we've already discussed, uh, Emin Gunzira and Mosa and Ayal. Um, any thoughts on this paper? Um, anyone want to summarize the key, the key findings from this paper? I can give it a stab. Um... So they were the first paper uh, in the space. They defined uh, a new opcode, which acts rather like a regular expression that says, uh, you know, I'm going to examine your redeem script and I'm going to impose some restrictions, which are essentially kind of arb an arbitrary sort of regular expression on your um, on your script. The second thing that they defined uh, is a recursive covenants, um, which is the thing Greg Maxwell doesn't like, uh, as well as the um, kind of a protocol where uh, if somebody managed to steal your funds, you can get yourself into a game where uh, you keep replacing each other's transactions until the entire value of the UTXO goes to fees. Uh, and they claim that this is somehow beneficial because the thief uh, can't actually steal anything. Um, I, that aspect of the paper, uh, I don't actually like very much. I don't think anybody wants to get into a game where they lose their funds anyway, even if they prevent the attacker from gaining them. They send them to fees instead. Uh, but anyway, those are kind of the, broadly the three things in that paper. Cool, thanks, Bob. Anybody else, else read that paper? So I'll actually disagree. I think it is valuable to have the lose everything to fee because um, you know it comes down to the following: Would you rather fund an adversary or lose your money? I mean, at the end of the day, I'd rather win that way neither. <laughs> well, unfortunately, unfortunately, the contrived scenario is that you haven't. Well, no, that's not true. I mean, you can definitely have neither. You don't have to get yourself into this game where you're paying fees. Any other thoughts on that paper? Otherwise, we we'll move on. I'm not seeing any hands. Just a just a quick question. What was yep. the uh, what exactly was the uh, name of the? Because uh, I remember that they did introduce a new opcode for it, which is probably why it didn't go anywhere. But what was that called? I'm looking at the paper now, and I can't find it. Uh, they, they called it opcov. Um, there are a few problems with it. it. It wasn't just sort of like the uh, technical like. Uh, you know, capability that it introduced. Like, I don't think that the proposal was actually like that secure. Uh, like there are a few like gotchas in it that would make it hard to deploy. So I, I, that, that's part of with BIP 119, what I tried to answer is figuring out some of these, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like the integration questions of like, okay, if you're really signing transactions, what can go wrong? And it turns out with, with a design that's not restrictive enough, there's a lot of like weird edge cases you can run into. So I think that's a little bit of why it's, like that proposal just didn't go anywhere. 
Well, you know, the other thing that I remember, Jeremy, is that in that um, paper in 2016, that, that the manuscript was published around the time that um, uh, BIP 68 and BIP 112 occurred, the relative time locks. And I think in the paper itself, it said something like, this is going to require a hard fork, I think, is what the paper says, um, which strikes me as odd. I, yeah, I it was published right just, before those BIPs. Um, I think they probably just I, didn't know. Yeah. I had a post after that, which used the deleted key thing uh, and those opcodes, because uh, it was obvious to me that they had missed that. Um, but yeah, that, that paper does not talk about time lock opcodes correctly. OK, I'll move on unless anyone said anything. Um, so then we, I think the next link is Jeremy's talk in 2017 at, oh, oh yeah. So this is Jeremy's uh, presentation at Stanford uh, Blockchain Protocol Analysis Security Engineering Conference. Uh, so this was your first presentation that I saw, Jeremy, on covenants. Um, and it had a bunch of different use cases um, and your current thinking back then, um, including some interesting use cases like Naughty Banker, et cetera. So of all these use cases, like which ones are still of interest now? Um, and how has your thinking changed since that presentation? I, I enjoyed that presentation. I thought it was very informative. Um, yeah, hang on a second. Let me pull up what the, uh, what the use cases were again, uh, just to remind myself. Um, the, the, the one that I think really stands out as one that I think is uh, important. Um, uh, where are my slides? Uh, so uh, congestion control kind of exists as a, um, uh, let me send out my slides to everyone because I think hey, I have a link. Hey, Jeremy, I, um, I actually have a link to the transcript if you want to click that in the chat here. Uh, I want the slides. So. Okay. Um, there's a yeah, link. I think I, well. One moment. Yeah. OK, I have a link ready. Um, OK, here's the slides. Oh, um, oh, it's also in the paste bin. All right. Well, there's another link to them. Um, so uh, a lot of them are still useful. I think that the congestion control is particularly of note. Um, the example I gave uh, was how to use congestion control for like lightning resolution, where you want to lock in a resolution, and then you'll you know kind of do the, the details later. But a lot of the things like uh, uh, optical isolated contracts um, and um, uh, there's some vault stuff somewhere in here too. Like those stuff, that stuff is obviously still interesting. Let me find where the, the vault related things are. Um, some of the opcodes, like in, in this pr presentation, I define like a bunch of different types of opcode. Um, and uh, those could still be interesting. Um, so one of the things that I define here uh, is a way of doing like a, a tap script style thing at the transaction level, where if you had transactions that you can mark as being required to be spent within the same block, then you could have scripts that expand out over the series of transactions. Um, and that's actually kind of, uh, a, at least in my opinion, a slightly more interesting primitive to work with because then you can have scripts that are required to expand out over over a number of blocks, but then they split out how the how the funds are being distributed to different UTXOs, um, and, and you can kind of build out some different uh, flows and primitives based on based on that that kind of expansion. I think that those those types of things could be interesting in the future. So a lot of, I, I I don't think there's anything that's irrelevant in this presentation at this point, um, but it's just sort of like carving out the small bits that we know how to do safely in Bitcoin um, and, and making it work. Um, there are a few that aren't here that, I, that I'd be excited to add. One, one that I've been thinking about as sort of a next step for, um, for Bitcoin after a check template verify or an equivalent gets merged is I'd really like to see an opcode that allows you to check how much value is in an output um, as you're executing. Uh, a really simple use case you can imagine for this is that uh, you paste an address to somebody and if it's under one Bitcoin, um, you have just a single key because it's not that much. But if it's uh, over a Bitcoin, then you have multi-sig. Um, and you can use that as sort of a safety mechanism in a number of different applications. And I think that that's uh, potentially an important uh, important thing going forward that wasn't in this presentation. But it's worth looking at if you're if you're thinking about how to, how to contract in the UTXO model, what sorts of things could be possible. I don't know if that answers your question. 
yeah, definitely. Any any other thoughts? Has anyone uh, watched this presentation or read? I I did the tran transcript for it. Because there were there were lots of small. Uh, let's go to Max. Let's go to Max. Um, I I'm still somewhat lacking in intuition on why this is a improvement for um, uh, congestion, right? So what, how can it save fees in times where there's currently a lot of uh, or a high fee level? Um, so if someone could explain that a bit more um, uh, succinctly, that that would be nice. Thank you. Uh, I, I I'm happy to unless someone else wants to jump in. Go for it, Jeremy. Okay, so. The idea of congestion control um, is mostly that there's a fundamental amount of traffic that has to happen, but there's a peak demand. And you, what you want to do is you want to, uh, it's, it's kind of like coronavirus, you want to flatten the curve. Um, so I was looking at all these diagrams that people are putting out of flatten the curve. I'm like, hey, this is what I've been working on for the last year. Um, so let's say it's lunch hour and we have... Uh, like 10 megabytes uh, of transaction data coming in every 10 minutes, but it's only for an hour. Then over the rest of the day, those transactions are just gonna be clearing. With the congestion control solution, um, what you can do is you can commit to all of them, confirm all of them, and then only when they need to be redeemed, do they ha then have to pay fees. So you've kind of spread out the, like you, you've localized the confirmation window for all of them, confirm them all at one time, and then you spread out the redemption window of where somebody actually goes and gets an individualized UTXO out. Um, so the reason why this ends up decreasing fees is if you think about fees as like a bidding market, you're bidding for two different goods. You're bidding simultaneously for confirmation and you're bidding for redemption. And that's an inefficient market because those are two separate quantities. By splitting out the quantities, you bid one price for confirmation and then that confirmation price can be shared among a number of actors and then you bid a separate price for redemption. And so that has the effect of basically allowing you to uh, have fewer people bidding for the in the confirmation market with Check Template Verify, and then more people bidding in the redemption market. Um, so I think that that is sort of like the, the shape of why it's gonna be an improvement if that, if that makes sense, Max. Yeah, uh, uh, Max, thank you very you much. Um, one one follow-up question here. So let's say I make a transaction that pays 100 users, right? And, and I get that confirmed at a low fee. And then how, how does that work with the users redeeming um, their coins? Yeah. Does it have yeah. to happen for all the 100 users at the same time? Or can 10 users do it fast and the other 90 do it slower? So Check Template Verify is a general purpose opcode. It doesn't like do like one of these things like specifically. So the answer is like, well, what do your users want, uh, essentially? So one, um, so, so what happens sort of the API, and we can also talk about like mining revenue because I think it's important when we're talking about something that looks like it's reducing fees. If it's improving revenue, I, I think it does improve revenue, but that's a separate conversation. So what you would do is you would bundle up all your 100 users into a transaction. You would have a single output for all of them. Then you would create that. And then you would probably end up paying very high fee on that transaction because it's representing confirmation for 100 users. So, but a high fee on a transaction with one output is a lot lower than low fee on 100 transactions or 100 outputs, right? So you're still saving money as the user, but you're you're maybe paying a higher fee rate. So, what you give to your users is essentially, uh, if they have an old wallet, it essentially looks like an unconfirmed spend. So it would just be like, hey, look, here's an, a couple unconfirmed spends. And you can structure those spends as any data structure uh, that you want that's a uh, sort of like a tree of some sort. So like a linked list is a tree. You could have something where it's just one person, the next person, next person. That's a little bit inefficient. It turns out that it's optimal for the users to do a tree of Radix 4. So you'd have a tree that says, okay, pay out to these four groups. And each group of four pays out to four groups. And each group of four pays out to four groups. And then the, the total amount of work that you have to do is log n to get it at single redemption in transaction space and amortized over all the users. It's only a constant amount of transaction overhead. So Jeremy, I mean, one, one interesting point here is in the tree structure, um, the way that this is set up is that um, in certain scenarios, some users are paying a little bit more than others. Yeah, essentially what it builds, um, I, I mean, 
because it's a like one of the issues is like is it a balanced tree or not um so like you know is some is some user like you know a little bit less it turns out that you know we're talking we're already talking logarithmic so it's already going to be pretty small um and we're talking maybe like plus or minus one on on the depth in the tree um so you can pay a little bit more but the other side of it is that uh users who want to redeem earlier subsidize users who redeem later because it's amortized over all the users so if if you imagine, let's say that um, I have a branch that's that ultimately yields a group of four, and one of those people decides that they really want their coins, well, them getting their coins actually subsidizes the creation of everybody else who's one of their neighbors along the path. Uh, and, and so there is a thing where like naturally there's a priority queue, which is already what you want to have. Uh, I think in Bitcoin, you want to have the fee market be a priority queue where people who have higher priority, higher requirement of getting their transaction through end up paying more. What this changes it is it changes the redemption uh, to sort of like a lazy process where you do it whenever demand is low enough to justify your use case. You're not worried about confirmation. The alternative is that these transactions sit unconfirmed in the mempool, which I think unconfirmed funds are are far worse. And and the the, the real benefit of that, um, and this goes back to why I think um, this is really good for for multi party situations, is these payouts can also be like lightning channels. So you're wondering, how am I going to get liquidity on this thing? It turns out that you can immediately start routing it in the Lightning Network. That, that's sort of one of the benefits of, of this sort of design is it, is it allows you to bootstrap uh, Lightning channels much more easily. Because you're not time sensitive on the creation of the channel there. As long as it's confirmed. Uh, can I, cool. can I so we, interrupt? Yeah. Uh, can I interrupt? Yeah, all? go for it, Adam. Yeah. So I just wonder if we could uh, dial back a little bit because I think we've gone like jumped a, a couple steps ahead, and I, I, I want to yeah, I want to make sure that I understand the most basic concept because um, I think Max was maybe asking a similar thing. See if it makes sense. So I'm, I'm, do I understand that the most basic concept of congestion control here is that you uh, because with this covenant mechanism, you're able to effectively treat unconfirmed transactions or, or chains of unconfirmed transactions as if they're sort of settled, so to speak. And that this distinction about confirmation and uh, redemption, you were saying, is that uh, that the, the, the user or the or the, or the the receiver can kind of treat the money as having been received, even though it's not in a in a Bitcoin block because there's a covenant. Is that right? That, that, that's exactly correct. Uh, if you look, uh, I just sent the diagram. Hey, yeah. Jeremy, real quick. Yeah, maybe screen share the diagram real quick on UTF.org. Um, I think that would screen, be... Screen sharing does not work for me. So if somebody else wants to screen no. share the diagram... Um, I, I, think I think it doesn't work, it doesn't work for you, Jeremy, if you... Uh, it uh, has a if you... large tendency to crash my computer. So <laughs> it, it, it will possibly work, and then I will possibly drop out of the call. So uh, okay, I will I will not screen that. share. Okay. If anybody that does want to screen share, I'm going to not because I need to monitor everyone on the call. But uh, it's the button bottom left. Uh, bottom left, there's three icons. There's a share your screen icon, a raise your hand icon, and a chat. I mean, icon. I'll, I, I can I can give it a try. Let's see what happens. Okay. Okay. Come back if you fall off the call. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's it's sort of like one of the settings is not great at uh, handling when you have like multiple 4K monitors going. It's some, it has a tendency to crash. Okay, uh, can everybody see that? That works. Yeah, I can see that. Okay. Um, so if you look at this diagram, I compare um, normal transactions uh, where you have um, you know some inputs uh, and you have uh, pink is sort of like the payments and green uh, and blue is like your change UTXOs. This is normal transactions on the left. And then if you go to normal batching, um, then you kind of go to a world where, um, and I think I, I think I have the colors opposite here. These should be pink and the, the other one should be uh, the other color. Um, so uh, then you have a number of outputs and then a single change and it's more efficient. And then with congestion controlled payments, what you do is you have a single output um, and then you can have some sort of tree of possible redemption paths underneath. And here I show um, sort of like a little bit more advanced demo, but just ignore the part to the to the right and just imagine you go down down with this Radix 4 tree. You see you go down to option B and then um, you have, uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. Um, uh, just a note to everyone, you can go to utxos.org and see this on your on your browser if it's easier, slash uses, slash scaling. Yeah. 
So you can see that um, you go um, and, and you expand out and then you have all these different transactions. And what this diagram is showing you is that the different uh, leafs and, and sort of nodes of this, of this transaction graph can be expanded at different times and in different blocks. So if you look at um, sort of like the gray boxes, just like look at the size of them. Obviously, normal transactions is the worst. It's the biggest gray box. Then batch transactions is the next uh, smallest. And then uh, congestion controlled transactions are even smaller. So your real time block demand is really low. And then at some time later, these other transactions can be played, but they're guaranteed to go down that route. Now, the optionality that I'm showing answers the question that Max had earlier, which is, well, like, what, how do they actually redeem? Is you could redeem on different types of trees. So the one on the right is sort of option A. That's like, OK, let's redeem as like a single step and pay out to everyone. Uh, that actually is immediately a useful, a useful one and is maybe a little bit easier to understand and integrate into existing wallet infrastructure that's just like, OK, yes, it's just a single unconfirmed you know, like parent for this transaction. But if you want you know, optimal efficiency on a per user basis, then you would do sort of a tree expansion. Because in the in the option A, it's like less fair if you're the one person who wants to redeem your funds. You've got to pay for everyone. Whereas on the option B, you only have to pay for uh, log N of everyone else, which is you can kind of ignore. Uh, so there's a question in the YouTube chat. Uh, how is this different to child based parent? Um, so the difference between this and child pays for parent is that uh, Child pays for parent is a non-consensus um, like rule around deciding which transactions you should mine. Uh, this is a consensus rule ar around being able to prove that a transaction creates another tr transaction. So in this world, you actually do end up wanting to use child pays for parent, um, where you can um, like attach your spending transaction with a higher fee to pay for the stuff up the chain. Um, so. In this example, if you see like these bottom things, you would spend from one of these outputs, and then you would attach um, a high fee to it, uh, and then that would subsidize the the chain of unconfirms. So it's related to child pays for parent in that way, but it's a distinct concept in that these uh, pending transactions are completely confirmed. So there's no requirement to do child pays for parent in order to get confirmation of the parent. That's the that's the difference. Cool. Thank you. Any questions otherwise i'll move on i mean i guess i'll point out another hands. difference that child pays for parent doesn't mm -hmm. require a soft work so but i mean it doesn't accomplish the same thing either so yeah i i think the other uh, thing i would add if, if we're going to go tongue-in-cheek is uh i'm going to probably end up removing child pays for parent or or like completely having to re-architect it like the the mempool is a big project right now uh and there's a lot of stuff that doesn't quite work how people think it works. Uh, transaction pinning is one of the, one of these issues that comes up, and it's a result of our like child pays for parent policy. So there, there's a very complicated relationship between a lot of these, uh, you know, sort of like fixes, features, and problems we end up having. Okay, we'll go to Max. Um, how how would or can we still do child pays for parent for that commitment uh, CTD transaction? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, you just spend from the child and then it's uh, child pays for parent. Uh, but that, that's where the mempool uh, issues come in is that if the mempool, the mempool doesn't actually like child pays for parent doesn't actually work like that. This is like the problem that people are coming into with lightning. People have a model of what child pays for parent means. And the model that they have is perfect economic rationality. It turns out that perfect economic rationality is like an NP hard problem. So we're never going to have a perfectly rational mempool. We're always going to be rejecting things that look good. It just turns out that the current child pays for parent policy we have is really deficient for most use cases. So child pays for parent uh, already like only works in like a couple handful of cases. It doesn't work, for example, for the Lightning Network. Um, even with a recent carve out, it, it still doesn't really work properly. OK, we'll go Spencer. Jeremy, is there any consideration to um, to how exactly you structure the tree with Radix four? So, is there a is there any way to know? Or, I guess how do how do I phrase the, 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 this question? Um, 
I guess, is there a certain, you know, algorithm or protocol that you do to place certain outputs in certain positions of the tree, or is it kind of just left random or um, kind of open to whatever implementation, whoever wants to implement this does? Yeah, that, that, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's open to implementation. Um, you know, the op okay. code is generic and you can do whatever you want. Now that said, uh, there are some really compelling ones that I've thought of um, that I think uh, would be good. One would be if you have priority information on like how likely people are to be in the same priority group, you can either choose to have a neutral priority arrangement where you try and pair high priority with low priority, or you can do something which is like a fair arrangement where high priorities with other high priorities, so people are more likely to share fees. Um, there's also um, other sort of like fun layouts that you can do where it's like the probability of this one being redeemed quickly, and then you can, um, you know, Huffman encode the tree based on that. Um, the other one that I really like, um, and this goes into uh, uh, the lightning side of things, which is a bit more advanced, is you can order things by the probability of, uh, people being able to cooperate. So if you have some notion of who knows other people, then um, you can do sort of like a recursive multi-party lightning channel tree. And then if you group people by the probability that they're able to work together in a group, then you kind of make an optimal, uh, like updatable, you know, tree state. Um, so that one I'm, I'm really excited about as sort of like a payment pool option. Uh, the last one would be is if you're making payments out and they might be the same service, you can make a payment tree where um, thing you know keys that you suspect are owned by the same wallet uh, exist uh, like uh, you know in the same sub branches, and then there's an opportunity for cutting out some of the uh, sort of redemption transactions by just redeeming at at that higher order node. So gotcha. there are a lot and, of options. Sorry. Yeah, Go that ahead. was actually my uh, my next question about the lightning prob like the prob the probabilistic payout. So um, thank you, uh, thank you for answering that. Can I ask a question real quick? Um, Jeremy, could you talk a bit more about Child's Proof Parent? Because I think one way to describe this is that instead of the sender paying fees, the receiver can pull, uh, and therefore the receiver has to pay fees, which means the receiver is going to have to use Child's Proof Parent to, to do that, right? Could you talk a bit more about the interplay between those two? Yeah, so Child's Proof Parent isn't the only way to pay fees. There, There's like a, you know, there's a litany of ways to, to pay fees in one of these systems. Uh, child pays for parent is, I would just say the best way because it's a pure uh, it's a pure API where uh, you want to declare which transactions you want to do. And then the paying of fees for those should be abstracted away from the actual uh, like execution. So child pays for parent is kind of good at just being able to, to express these arbitrary, you know, like relationships. It actually turns out that there that there are better APIs, and that's one of the other you know sort of soft forks I'm looking at of, that that maybe we can do is something that gives us a much more robust fee subsidizing um, you know uh, methodology. Um, the um, can, can you can you repeat what the the, the meat of the question is, Bob? Sure, just that so. If the receiver wants to pull a payment out of the tree, right, and, and get it confirmed for whatever reason, um, he may have to pay fees, right? So the, the end transaction at the end of the tree could pay fees. It may not be enough. The receiver may have to add sure. fees to that, and they may desire to, uh, which means they have to use some kind of replacement. And due to the structure uh, of CTV, uh, replaced by fee is not going to be no. viable, right? So you have no, to hold, on, hold on, hold on. I, I think you can. I don't think you would replace the fees on the end of it. I mean, I guess you could. But I mean, I, I was expecting that a fault would be you do make a child transaction that pays the fees in, adi in addition to whatever you pull out of the tree. That, that's exactly that's what I'm saying. Right. Yeah, so replace by fee um, works fine with check template verify. Um, the only issue that comes up is if you want check template verify to be inherently lightning compatible, then replace by fee is not a lightning compatible idea uh, in general. Uh, because you have to worry about the state of HCLCs in subcontracts. So you can't arbitrarily replace by fee because you may be bound to a specific UTXO. Uh, if you had things like any prev out, um, then that wouldn't necessarily be true because then you would, you would be able to get around um, some of those constraints. But the reason why I prefer, um, I prefer a ch uh, child pays for parent is it doesn't disturb the TXIDs in your parents and in your own branch. 
So I think TXID stability is, at least for the current Lightning Network designs that we have, is really an important property. But you can use replace by fee. It just it just changes your TXID. Um, and, and if you yeah. want that, there, there's even with check template verify, there's two forms of it. There is an unbounded form where you allow um, any output to be added that adds you know more money. Um, there's also a bounded form that's possible, um, sort of through like a little quirk, but I, I, I like that it, that you can do it, um, where using a P2SH SegWit address, um, I think it has to be a P2SH SegWit address, uh, you can specify which key is allowed to add a dynamic amount of fee. So if you pick a key that is known to be of the parties in that subtree, then it would only be through the coordination of those entities that the TXID could be changed. So if you are trying to do a lightning thing and then the replace by fee requires coordination of all the sub owners, it, it can kind of work as well in a protected form that protects your sort of state of HTLCs. But I think that that's like a complicated thing to build out. And I think child pays for parent is conceptually a lot simpler. Because reissuing transactions, like replace by fee does not work well for a lot of services. Like this was one of the big debates around replace by fee in the first place is that people didn't like it because people wanted to issue one TX ID and they wanted to be an exchange and say, here's your TX ID and then not worry about having to reissue the TX ID because it looks like a double spend and wallets get upset and chains of transactions spending unconfirmed get upset. So replace by fee is really an awful, you know, it, I mean, it, it's not awful that, that the code supports it, but it's an awful thing to, I think, use in practice uh, because it has like, you know, bad externalities. Uh, so I, I think it's just more robust. That's the reason why I've been advocating child pits for parent. Okay, any other questions or comments? We've jumped straight into use cases. Um, uh wary of so i wonder if uh i wonder if jeremy like you could step, take a step back and just explain what check template verify is uh, in comparison to some of the other covenant designs uh yeah um so check template verify um you know like I, people looked at the presentation that i gave in 2017 at, at that time i was like covenants are really cool let me think about what sort of like all the space of covenants are because the the Amin Gunsire paper, like it only covers one type of covenant, which is a how an output has to be spent, but it doesn't cover covenants around uh, which other inputs you have to be spent with. It doesn't cover things around, you know, there's just like a wide scope of things. So I, I was like, okay, let me think about this. And I thought about it and I was like, this is really cool. And I tried to get people excited, people got excited, but then in, at, at the implementation point, people are like, well, this, this stuff is actually kind of scary to do. And we're not really sure what, what's possible to do, you know, safely in Bitcoin. We have all these properties we want to preserve around how transactions behave in reorgs. We want to make sure that we're not creating. And it's like, okay, like let's let's do a long study of of how this stuff should work. Um, and so I was doing that, try, you know, kind of working on other things, figuring out what what makes sense. Uh, a lot of the proposals for covenants have like flaws in either how much computation they're expecting a validator to do. Uh, or uh, in what uh, sort of uh, abstractions and, and uh, you know boundaries they violate um, in terms of transaction validation context, like observe, observing things that you're not supposed to observe. Um, so as that um, as I went by, I sort of started building vaults uh, in like 2016, uh, and I was talking to some people about building it and. I had a, a design that was that was I, I think it ended up being somewhat similar to like uh, to what Revault looks like, and I was using like lots of like you know niche features like Sigcash, you know like special Sigcash flags for making some of the stuff work. But at the end of the day, like it it really was not working that well. So I went I went back to the drawing board. I started thinking about it, looking at okay, well how can you do like big ECDSA multi signatures to to emulate having big pre sign chains. And I tried to get people excited about this at one of the core dev uh, meetings. And people said, look, we're just like, you know, we're like, this stuff doesn't is not is not what we're interested in. No one would review it. And I said, Okay, I, I stepped back, I said, I'm trying to accomplish a specific goal. What's the most conservative minimal op code I could introduce that would do that without having uh, any sort of uh, major, you know, security impact 
ch changed to, um, uh, to, to Bitcoin. So I came up with uh, Check Template Verify and it had a couple of precursors, um, but the design is basically the same. It was actually more conservative originally. I've actually made it more flexible um, in, in this iteration. Um, and I presented that to uh, the uh, San Francisco uh, bit devs. Um, and the response um, and you know the usual suspects were, were there. Uh, the response was very positive. People were like, yeah, this seems like a covenant proposal that does not have that much complexity we're expecting from validation and does not have that much potential for like a negative recursive or viral use case that would that would have some some large problem. So the design of check template verify is really not um, and nothing much asks. Uh, yeah, so it's it's uh, used to be called secure the bag. Uh, also used to be called check outputs hash verify. Um, it was kind of a little bit of a you know back and forth where I originally called it check outputs hash verify because I was like, let me name it the most boring thing that is exactly what it does. And then everybody at the meetup was like, that name sucks. You got to name it something more fun. And I was like, okay, I renamed it secure the bag. And then the other half of people were like, Bitcoin is serious business, no funny names. So then I renamed it to check template verify, which I think is like conceptually there, but it's not that you know boring um, as check outputs hash verify. Um, and, and, and it really gets to the heart of what the idea is of what type of covenant you're writing. Essentially, all that you're doing is saying, here is a specific transaction template. And a template is everything except for the uh, specific uh, C out points that you're spending, except for the specific coins that you're spending. So that covers sequences, version, lock time, uh, script sigs, um, out and, and outputs, of course, um, and whatever other fields I may have missed that that are um, in the TXID uh, commitment. Um, and then, uh, I mean, Spencer, if, if people are writing in the chat that they want to bring back secure the bag. If you want to bring it back, like I have no business with that. I, I can't be responsible. Um, so, uh, and then it just checks that the hash of the transaction matches those details. Uh, and then that, that's basically it. Um, that's why it's a template. It's like, here's the specific transaction that I want to do. Now, if you want to do more than one transaction, you're like, well, what if I want option A or option B? Simple, wrap it in an if else. So say, okay, if you pass in one, then do transaction one. If you pass in two, you know, zero, do transaction two. Um, and then that's yeah, how that's you build out. So, uh, so actually, um, yeah. So actually, um, you know, when I was working on my Bitcoin vaults prototype and I was doing the check template verify implementation version just to, I was originally doing secure key deletion. And then I was like, well, I should try BIP 118. And I asked Jeremy, well, you know, this if else thing kind of sucks if you have like a lot of branching. And um, Jeremy suggested a very simple script that, that was significantly more concise. So, you know, that was interesting. Yeah, there, there's a lot of, uh, I, I've become a little bit of a script virtuoso um, where there's a lot of like funny script paradigms that you can do uh, with the, with the stuff to to make it really easy to implement. Um, so it's not like the if else stuff always bothered me because like, do you do a big chain of if else's or do you do like sort of like the balanced tree branch conditionals and pass stuff in? It turns out there's a script um, that that Brian's referencing where you just have to pass in the number of the branch that you want to take, and then uh, it's that simple. Um, I, I have Brian. Maybe I'll maybe I'll send it to you for review. Um, I think I posted on on Stack Overflow actually somewhere um, a script which emulates a switch statement where you pass in a number and then it takes whatever uh, branch of code you want to execute uh, underneath, which I think is is in some way it's a little bit less more verbose, but it's very easy for a compiler writer to target. So, okay, okay we'll go Adam. You... Oh, sorry, go for it. Go for it, Bob. Uh, um, we'll go Bob, we'll go Bob, and then we'll go Adam, and then we'll go Spencer. Okay. Wait, shouldn't it be me first as I put my hand up? <laughs> okay, sure. Okay, Adam go first. <laughs> Bob, yeah. Uh, I just, I just want to get a bit of uh, clarification. Maybe, maybe I should just be reading the documents, but um, people might be interested because uh, you said that check template verify is essentially looking at what the TXID encompasses. In other words, the template transaction. But does that? But then you said it included the script sig and it doesn't include the C out points. And I was confused because it's surely isn't it the other way around? Uh, no. So it, it includes everything that can affect the. So, so one critique that comes up that, that sometimes people say is that I have designed check template verify for a very specific use case. And there's a more general thing out there that, um, that, that maybe could be better. That, that's a little bit true. 
the specific use case that I have in mind is where you have a single input. Um, and there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, that's why I talked about the malleability before is if you have a single input, there's no malleability that you can have with the, with the transaction uh, C out point if you know one parent C out point, because you know that one parent C out point and then you can compile down the tree and then you can fill in all the details uh, as they go. And it's all sort of deterministic. So that's one of the use cases that I haven't, it's not that it's specifically designed for that, but it's specifically designed so that use case works really well. Now, when you, when you look at the script SIGs, uh, that's a little bit weird. It basically means that you mostly cannot use um, like bare script for uh, check template verify um, because you are committing to signatures there if you have signatures. Now, if you have a bare check template verify where it's just a check template verify, you can use a bare script because you don't actually put anything in your script SIG. But as soon as you have signatures and other things, you end up having a hash cycle. So the way that you get around that is you use a SegWit address. And then in a SegWit address, the witness data is not committed to in the TXID. So your signatures and stuff are all safe, unless it's a P2SH one, and then you just commit to the program. So that's why I said you can use the SegWit P2SH as like sort of a little bit of a cool hack where you can commit to which other key has to be spending. That's the reason why you're committing to the script SIGs, but not the C out points. Does that make sense? It, it, the script SIGs affect the uh, TXID, but given given a known chain of check template verifies, um, like the C out point does not affect the TXIDs, given given a single parent known C out point. Okay, I'm gonna have to think about that. Thanks. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably... give you I'll give you I'll give you a concrete example. Yeah. So let's say that um, so one of the big benefits of check template verify is that you have all these non interactive protocols where I can just define here's an address. And then if co if enough coins move into this address, then uh, I've started a lightning channel uh, without having to do any back and forth with my counterparty. That, that That's an example. And now if I, mm. it, I still need to know in order to update that channel state, the TXID of the channel that eventually gets created. Mm. So if I spend to create that, um, that to that address and it has a single input, um, then I know who spent to it and I know that the C out point and I can fill in all of the TXIDs below and those TXIDs won't change. So any uh, terminal state that I'm updating with an HTLC is guaranteed to be stable. If I had malleability of the TXID, um, either by having replaced by fee or by having um, you know, multiple inputs or you know, not committing to the set of data that I commit to, then you would run into the issue um, th that I'm mentioning where uh, things can get disrupted. Um, okay. it, 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 it's a little bit uh, abstract, but it, it, if you read the BIP, it's, it, there's a lot of language explaining sure. Sure, uh, why it's set up that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Spence, his hand up next, uh, and then after Spence, we'll go Bob. Um, I think you touched up on it. Uh, so this may be a little bit off topic, so we can come back to it later. Um, but I think you touched on it during your CTV workshop back in February. Um, can you elaborate how if all tap script affects um, some of the scripts that you and Brian mentioned uh, just a few minutes ago, or just um, you know CTP scripts in uh, in uh, in general? Uh, yeah. So tap script makes a lot of this stuff just like much easier. Um, so uh, yeah, that that makes all all of this like compilation of like worrying about having like in, in tap script you'd never use an op if. Uh, or you know, you you would there are use cases because sometimes you have a combinatorial blow up in in script complexity, so you would use it for maybe like those purposes. Um, but you you wouldn't you need to use it in in most use cases. Um, so I think that that's uh, yeah, it, TapScript TapScript makes a lot of these things just like much easier to do. Um, uh, you also I think as I mentioned like you could have an opcode which is like this is an intermediate output and it has to be spent by the end of this block or this transaction yep. can't be included that would give you the same functionality with uh, check template verify. Um, it, it, it's about just being able to like have like some branch that has to execute and you don't need to pass in sort of like all these like bytes in order to just signify which branch you want to execute which is just kind of it's just painful to do that. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you. Okay, Bob next. Um, I was wondering, uh, Jeremy, if you could kind of elaborate some of the arguments and kind of arguments uh, for or against the uh, implementation implementation of CTV in particular. Uh, you know, there's a 
balance between making a super restrictive opcode, right? And as you said, you start with something more restrictive and you move to something less restrictive. One of the things I've been fooling with lately is uh, the new simplicity language, which, you know, if we got that soft forked into Bitcoin, uh, has bare access to essentially all of the transaction data. And you could compose anything you wanted uh, as far as a covenant goes. And it's, you know, perhaps the polar opposite in terms of flexibility. Um, I've actually been thinking about implementing CTV just for the fun of it and simplicity just to, just to see, understand how it works. Um, could you, yeah, can you elaborate like kind of what is the yeah. spectrum here? Like yeah. what is too restrictive, what is not restrictive enough and why? So simplicity is really cool, uh, first off. Um, I don't think it does what you think it does uh, in the sense that Maybe you, can write, <laughs> you can write a valid contract in simplicity for whatever covenant you want, but it's not necessarily executable on chain because as you write more comp complicated scripts in simplicity, your, the runtime goes up and you, you have some certain run limits or fee limits on how much work a transaction can require. And unless you get a soft fork for the jet for the specific one that you want to add, uh, you can't do it. So I think the way that I think about simplicity is simplicity is what if we had the optimal language for our SIG hash flags? What would that look like? And simplicity lets you define whatever you want, and then you can easily soft fork compatibility. Where if you if you need to add, you know, old clients should be able to understand the new specification. Simplicity lets you do that, but simplicity doesn't necessarily like it lets you express these things. It doesn't necessarily let you make transactions based on them. So one, um, you know, one one point that I would also make about. Um, the compactness, and this is something that I've talked to Bram Cohen about, um, and you, you can ask him for you know his actual opinion if I misstate it. But even if you have a really sophisticated uh, covenant system, um, covenants are a uh, runtime compiled. Uh, you know, like a general covenant is runtime compiled, uh, where you're you're kind of interpreting and you're um, you know doing <laughs> doing whatever live in the script. Check template verify is ahead of time compiled. And so you only have to put on chain the data that that for the branches that you're actually doing. Now you could write that in simplicity as well, but I think that what you'd end up doing is implementing check template verify in simplicity. And I don't think that right now, given the complexity of simplicity as like a long-term upgrade, like we should ignore doing something that works today for that type of use case. Um, and and it, it is basically just saying like, you know, if you want to map it, we're just doing a jet today for this uh, check template verify type script and that'll be available in simplicity one day. Um, because because having this is it's both good for privacy and that you don't reveal your whole contract, but it's also good in terms of compactness in that you only reveal the parts of your contract that need to execute. So so there's sort of a lot of benefits rather than having like the complete program expressed in simplicity, um, uh, at least as far as I can tell. And, and then to to back up of like the question of like why have something restrictive or something you know very general. Um, it's really easy to audit what happens with check template verify. There's like a few things that you can do, a few different code paths, and the, it's you know like it's a hundred lines of code basically to add it to, to core. Um, so it, it's pretty easy. Uh, there's not um, like within an individual transaction uh, context, there's no like major validation overhead. Um, so it, it's just it's just simple to get going. Uh, it makes it easy to write tools around it because writing tools around a simplicity script is probably going to be relatively complicated because you're dealing with arbitrary binaries. So you're probably going to be using a few well-tested primitives in, in that use case. With Check Template Verify, it just like is a basic primitive. Uh, so the, the tooling ends up being pretty easy to, to implement as well. I think Brian can speak to that. Um, and uh, with, with with respect to like it originally starting more restrictive, um, the restrictions that I had originally were um, basically uh, around whether or not if you added different other features to Bitcoin, um, if check template verify would allow you to do more complicated scripts. Um, I removed those features because people said, well, no, if we, you know, we, we kind of want these things to be enabled because what I didn't want check template verify to occupy the space of is that we added check template verify and now we can't add this other thing that we want without enabling these very complicated contracts. So I said, I said, let me make this as restrictive as possible. People said, no, if we add those things, chances are we really do want these uh, more complicated contracts. This is like opcat, for example. And so uh, I said, okay, sure. You know, I'll, I'll remove these restrictions, make it a little bit more flexible. Um, and then 
now if you were to get um op cat or op shot to v6 stream in core then you would actually be able to start doing um like much more sophisticated check template verify um uh scripts um this gets to a, a separate question which I'll, I'll pose in a second so one thing that you could do for example is you could write a, a, a contract that says um this template must pay out to um all of these outputs and any output of your choosing and so this can be useful for example if you just want to like add an additional output you can't remove any of the outputs that are already specified but you could add another output so it, it gives you like some more flexibility if you had opcat but because we don't have it you can't really do that today now that gets to the point of like why not just do any prev out which also gives you sort of an analog for check template verify it's that there'd be no upgrade path for any prev out short of simplicity um, that would allow any prev out to ever gain um, sort of higher order templating facilities. So check template verify has a nice upgrade path for more flexibility in the future if we want it. Thanks. Cool. Um, I'm conscious that we're going to have to move on to vaults at some point um, because that's going to be the second part of the discussion. But I'll go nothing much uh, now. Go nothing much. Are you there? Nothing much. You had your hand up. I'll give you five seconds. No. Okay, I'll ask. I'll ask uh, his, it, Mike, Mike, Mike isn't yeah. working. So. Okay. Nothing much. Um, so, okay. not nothing much. Asks about recursion. Um, so, uh, on recursion. Um, so basically, all the recursion happens at compile time. So you can recurse as much as you want. But, um, and I actually, so this is sort of like a little bit under wraps right now, but I'm happy to just kind of describe it. I've been building a compiler for Check Template Verify. I'm hoping to release it sometime soon. Um, it, but um, you, the, the compiler ends up being Turing complete where you can compile any contract you want that, that expresses itself in Bitcoin transactions, but the compiler produces a finite list of Bitcoin transactions at the end of the day. And then there's no recursion within those. So those are just sort of a fixed set of transactions that can be produced. But if you want to have any recursion or any any principle, um, you know, you can you can do that in at the compile time, but not at the at the actual like runtime. Um, I don't know what bounded input size means, but um, I I think that, that that's a sufficient answer. Uh, we, we can follow up uh, offline about bounded input size. Okay, so there's a couple of things I'd like to cover before we transition to vaults. One is, um, so in that 2017 presentation, you talked about some of the grave concerns. Are you able to meet all of these concerns? So, so there's fungibility, privacy, competition explosion. Uh, ch -ch -ch. I don't know if you have the transcript of that talk up, but, um, but were you yeah. able to address those concerns that you were worried about in 2017? Uh, I think so. Um, so I don't think that there are, um, I don't think that in terms of, um, uh, so computational explosion, um, I think we're, we're completely fine. Um, we have, like, like I mentioned, compile time can be Turing complete, but that's equivalent to just saying like you on your own computer can run whatever software you want and emit whatever list of transactions you want at runtime. It has to be a finite set of transactions. So there's no sort of like, you know, infiniteness about it. Um, and then um, in terms of fungibility and privacy, um, I think it's relatively okay. Um, if you want privacy, there are ways of getting it um, in a different uh, trust model. So for example, if you want privacy and, and you're willing to have a multi-sig signing server, then you can use Taproot and you get a trust model where, um, you know, the the signing server could steal your funds um, if you had, you know, all the parties, uh, you know, working together, um, but they can't go offline and steal your funds because you have an alternative redemption path. Um, and then in terms of, of fungibility, um, the, the issue I think is less around uh, whether or not um, people can tag your coins because that's the privacy issue. The fungibility issue is whether or not your coins can be spent with other coins. And because this is a program that's guaranteed to terminate and it has to terminate in a, in a coin that's unencumbered by any contract, um, then those coins can be spent with any other coin. So there's no sort of like ongoing recursive segregation of coins. So the fungibility issue, I 
I think is is addressed. And, and for privacy, I, I, th- what I would say is that I think that having on-chain contracts, um, these are really good on-chain contracts in terms of like you only show the part that you're executing, not the whole program. So you don't learn other branches of the program that, that might have been there. But you are seeing that you're executing a check template verified program. So there is like maybe a little bit of a privacy harm there. But the way that I like to think of this and why this is actually a huge win for privacy is this is going to enable a lot better layer two protocols um, and a lot more things like pay join um, and uh, uh, mixers. It's going to make a lot of those things more efficient. So our ability to add better privacy tools uh, to Bitcoin is going to improve um, because we, we're able to bootstrap these protocols more efficiently. So I think that I think it's going to be a big win for privacy overall. But um, you know, the actual on chain, there is some new information revealed. I wouldn't I wouldn't say there's nothing new revealed. Cool. So let's uh, let's let's go on to use cases. We've already discussed uh, congestion control. Perhaps uh, if you wouldn't mind, Jeremy, you could get up the UTXO site and go to your use use cases tab. Um, so one of them is congestion control. One of them is vaults. You have a bunch of other use cases there as well. Um, before yep. we actually move on specifically to vaults, perhaps you could talk about some of those different use cases and which of those are promising and or which ones you're currently focusing on. Uh, yeah. So my, uh, like I mentioned, I, I've been working on a compiler. Um, the set of use cases I now na- now have is probably like triple <laughs> of what's here. Um, there's there's a heck of a lot of stuff you can do. Um, every protocol I've looked at, like things like discrete log contracts, like all these things become much simpler to implement um, in, in this in this framework. So the use cases are pretty dramatic. Um, I'm really excited about non-interactive channels. Uh, I think that that's going to be huge. It gets rid of like you know 25% to 50% of the code base for like you know implementing a lightning channel because a lot of it's the initial handshaking. Um, and makes it possible to to do do certain things that are hard to do right now, um, and uh, yeah, the the other stuff is is all kind of like related, um, you know, with like scaling and trustless coordination free mining pools. Uh, you can kind of pay people out. Um, I, I think I sent Bob at some point some some graphs around this, um, but you can set up a mining pool that every block pays out to every single mining pool that participated in the mining pool over the last thousand blocks. And then you can do this on a running basis. And so you can have something where there's no central operator. You just you you only get to participate if you provably participated in, in paying out to the people as specified over the last thousand block run. Um, and then you can use the non-interactive channels to um, balance out so that the actual number of redemptions per miner ends up being one for every given time period that they're every given window that they you know exist in. You can, so you can minimize the amount of actual on-chain load while being completely trustless for the miners and receiving those redemptions. So there's a lot of stuff I think is really exciting for just making Bitcoin work um, as as a really good uh, base layer for uh, layer two. That 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 I think is something that is going to be the major uh, other use case. Another thing I'm excited about with vaults is vaults exist uh, not just as something for like an institution. But I think that they're also really important for people who are thinking about their like last will and testament type stuff, inheritance schemes. Um, you can set up, and this is where the non-interactivity becomes really important. You can set up an auditable vault system that pays out a trust fund to all of your, you know, inheritors without having their interaction and without having to um, sort of like a priori inform them of what the of what the layout is, um, and. Uh, it can be proved to an auditor, which is important for tax considerations. Because uh, you know, anytime you're like, "Hey, I gave, let's say, uh, ten million dollars of Bitcoin to my heirs," it's like, well, you have to prove when they got access to those funds, and uh, that's difficult to do in the current regime. Using Check Temple Verify, you can't actually prove that. You no, know, there's only one time path to, to redeem these funds, um, and you can set up things where there are opportunities to to reclaim your um, to reclaim your money if you were ever to come back from the dead. You know, so if you really were just lost on a desert island, you could come back and there would still be funds remaining and the time to payouts. So I'm really excited just with all the all the new types of things people are going to be able to do. Um, but vaults, uh, I think, are a really important use case. Um, I think that uh, vaults are important not just for um, individual uh, like you know businesses where you're like, oh, how are we securing our hot, hot wallet stuff? But I think vaults are actually most impactful for end users where you don't have the resources to employ people to be managing this for you. And you want to set something up where, um, let's say you've got an offline, um, 
you know, wallet that you can send money to, and then funds automatically come back online to your phone. But if you ever lose your phone, you can stop the flow of funds. So that's something I think is really exciting for um, Chicken Bull Verify in particular, is the ability to send funds to a vault address, and that vault address to automatically move funds to your hot wallet without requiring any signatures or anything. So the management overhead for a user is just very low. Um, and your your cold wallets, uh, you know, you, can just be keys that are only sent to in the event of a disaster that are like, let's say you're in seven different bank vaults around the world. So it's like you have your vault that you send to and then you don't have any um, like requirement to actually ever have those recovery keys uh, unless you need to recover. So that, that's, I think, the big difference with check template verify and vaults is that you remove keys from the hot path completely. Um, there's no need for, for signing. There's just need for sending the funds to the correct place. Cool. So are, th this vault diagram yep. is not accurate, by the way. There's there's sort of a like this is a this is a type of vault. Um, the ones that um, I implemented that are in the repo are uh, more similar, I think, to to the form that Brian um, put put out. And I'm assuming you're going to have to focus on like one or two use cases because obviously to like convince to get consensus on this, we you kind of need to convince that there is at least one real use case that people are going to get value out of. And then the flip side is making sure that it's not adding anything to the protocol that we don't want to add, right? So yeah, the upsides uh, and the downsides. Yeah, it's, it's been really difficult to be a singular advocate for this because um, you have to make uh, a lot of conflicting arguments that are that ultimately like work together. But um, you know, it's just like at if you just told you know one side and the other side, people would say like, well, how does that work? And it's like, well, this is how they work together. So an example of this is uh, Bob, Bob gives me a little bit of grief over like if you had to design an opcode that was specifically the best thing for vaults, would it be check template verify? And my opinion is yes. And then the question is, okay, well, like it does all this other stuff too. So is that is that really accurate? And, and you know, on the other side of the fence, there, I get people who say check template verify. You really only have a single use case that you care about. Like, can you show that you have like hundreds of use cases because we want to have things that are really flexible in general? And it's like, yes, it's very general. And, and, I, and it, what I'm hoping to show with the, um, so I'm, I'm building out this language I think I mentioned. Um, I'm hoping to show like, yes, it's really flexible and yes, it's really good for these use cases. And that, that hopefully will be available, um, you know, relatively soon. Um, the other sort of argument that's just difficult with, with this is like uh, talking about fees with scaling is I'm telling everybody this is going to dramatically reduce fees for users, but it's also going to increase mining revenue. How can both of those things be true? It's like, well, you have, you're have you making better settlement layer use of Bitcoin. So the transactions happening are going to be all of higher fee. You're going to have more users. It's, it's something called Jevons paradox, if anyone's curious, of like, as the system becomes more efficient, usage goes up. And so you don't actually end up saving. Cool. I'm going to put a seven minute limit and then we, we need to move on to vaults. Yeah. Uh, we'll go Max Absolutely. next. Max next. Max next. Yeah, yes, maybe uh, to build what you just said, Jeremy, um, to combine these different use cases. Um, could someone speak a bit more about having these, um, let's call them batched withdrawals, right? Where you have the check template verified to commit to the withdrawal transaction from users that then directly open non interactive channels. Right, so the, the kind of yeah. use case would be we have users buying. How would that work in this combination? Yep, exactly. So that works just like out of the box. So one of this is this is why I'm like very like adamant about like replaced by fee is like bad, is that what I really want to see is a world where I go to an exchange with an address, um, and they have no idea what that address is for. They just pay to it. Um, and they pay to it in, um, a, uh, you know, like one of these trees that sort of has like one TXID or like a known set of possible TXIDs for the eventual payout. Um, that lets me immediately start using a channel. And what's nice about this is the integration between those two components is zero. I don't need to tell the exchange I'm opening a lightning, a lightning, uh, address wallet. Um, I just tell them this is my address, pay this much Bitcoin to it. And there's no other, um, sort of like cooperation. So you can imagine a world where like you go to Coinbase and you give them a non-interactive channel address, it creates a channel for you. You give them a vault address, it creates a vault for you. You give them uh, an annuity, it gives you an annuity. Get, like you can you can set it up so that the system and, and with zero, like and, and literally I mean zero, it's just if you paste in the address and you send the right amount of funds, you get the right outcome. 
I think there's definitely some tooling and support I mentioned earlier, like having an opcode that lets you check how much money was sent to an address would be really nice. Um, and, uh, you know, that that's an example that would make this integration a little bit easier in case the exchange sends the wrong amount of money. Most exchanges I know send exact amounts. Um, so, some don't, but you, um, you know, that, I think that that's a relatively easy upgrade. It also could be a new address type that specifies how much money is supposed to go to go there. Um, so that the smart contracting side, you know, integrates really easily. But other than that, there's they don't need to know what your, your underlying contract is. Um, so I think that it just opens up a world of Bitcoin that that works a lot more seamlessly. Because um, right now, like if you wanted, it, and this is another big scaling benefit is right now, if you want to open a lightning channel, you've got funds on Coinbase, you're doing at least, uh, you know, like one or two intermediate transactions to get the funds into your lightning wallet and opened in a channel with somebody. In this case, you get rid of all those intermediate transactions. So, so, you know, if you're talking about how Bitcoin is going to scale as a, as a lightning channel thing, that's without having to get and convince exchanges to adopt, um, like a lot of new infrastructure for opening channels for users. By the way, <clears throat> this is basically one of the major benefits of CTV over, um, deleted keys. So we, uh, a year or so ago, um, started making a prototype by essentially making a pre-signed transaction and deleting a key, which is a mechanism to do a covenant. But the, one of the major problems with it is that uh, I have to send from my wallet, right? So I can't give somebody an address which sends directly to a covenant. And as Jeremy has described, um, with CTV, you can, because you can put the uh, the script right there. It reduces the number of total transactions, right? Because as he mentioned, if you want to open a Lightning channel, first you have to send it to your Lightning wallet, then you have to open the Lightning channel. It's at least two transactions. So the CTV route there is more efficient and, and perhaps more interesting in that someone can send directly to your vault. You cannot do that uh, generally with a um, deleted key type of covenant. And and I think Bob, what I would what I would add is even less so for for the vault use case than a scaling benefit. It's a big security benefit for a user that um, you know if you did have an exchange that you set up to understand you know vault protocols, you could say only allow me to withdraw to vault contracts, and you know it would it would have to you know receive maybe the vault description that you're having. Um, but you can also like, you don't have to have this intermediate wallet that you, that you move funds on, um, at, at, on your end that like maybe gets hacked with all the money. Um, so I, th I think it just adds a lot of user security having that, that story. Yep. Cool. Uh, so three minutes, any last questions on CTV or comments? Uh, we'll go Kevin. Yeah, um, so I didn't really catch up on the uh, San Francisco meetup uh, or workshop, so sorry if uh, it's a question that has been asked a lot of time. Um, how do you compare or differentiate um, against a SIG hash no input um, in terms of like vault specifically? Um, so like I understand that you can, with CTV, you can basically encumber the next transaction from the yeah, output uh, while you would do the opposite with the um, Sighash no input. Yeah, so actually with Sighash no input, you can perfectly emulate um, check template verify. Um, so it's not the obvious way of using Sighash no input, but it is uh, you know one way that you can use it. It emulates something that's very, very similar. There are a few drawbacks to that, um, that uh, methodology. Um, the first drawback is that it's it's just less efficient to validate, and your fees are going to be more expensive. Um, the uh, other, you know, drawback is that um, it is uh, it's a, a little bit um, like harder to compile, um, which which is annoying if you're talking about making contracts that have like. Maybe you only have log n possible resolutions, but you have like a very wide number of, of different possible cases. Your compiler is just going to be way slower, which imposes a limitation if you're using these contracts inside of Lightning channels on on how many resolutions you can have. So it makes them less useful uh, in a layer two context, uh, ne negligibly so, I guess. But it's like signatures are like a hundred thousand times slower than hashes. So you know, just just for reference, it is like a lot slower if you were doing a signature based one. Um, and then. Um, you're you're adding more functionality. So so say cash no input any prev out is just like less likely to to get into Bitcoin. There there are like this is what I talked about when I said like you have to preserve these like really critical invariants in Bitcoin. And it's pretty easy to show that like check template verify doesn't break these. 
but the broader set of functionalities that you have around sig hash no input you really do have like uh you know these like issues of like burning keys permanently as you signed with them and so you we have all these design constraints around sig hash no input that have come out around tagging keys and having sort of different specifiers in order to prevent these sort of like weird use cases Check template verify doesn't really have the same sort of uh, issues around like the fact that it's using like a hash that's only used for check template verify. It's not using keys that are used for general purposes and making keys into some sort of like toxic waste. Um, so I think that that's that's one of the other benefits um, in, in terms of like security. A last um, a, a last uh, sort of uh, note is that um, what was I going to say? Uh, it's not coming to me right now, but um, there, there's a few other reasons why um, why you would just prefer to have, uh, oh yeah, flex future flexibility. So if you add opcat later, uh, then you don't get new features with um, sig hash no input, uh, I, I think. Um, but then with uh, check template verify, you get a bunch of new types of uh, like, uh, you know, custom template contracts that you can write. So it has a better upgrading path in the future as well. Uh, check template verify also like the hashes are versioned. So if you add a new version to the hashes, you can add like a new sig hash flag field basically. Um, so there's more flexibility down the, down the road than with uh, sig hash no input like uh, functionality. But strictly speaking, yeah, I would be very happy if, if uh, sig hash no input and any prevo, any script were to get merged because that would let me just do it today. But I think it's just less likely. Um... Awesome. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Yeah, thank um, you. So, so we'll move on to vaults. Um, so obviously, for those that don't know, some vaults need check like template verify. Other vault designs don't. Uh, I think Kevin, uh, who will speak about his design next week, has got around using check template verify. But he did say in the interview with Aaron van Verden that ideally he'd have used check template verify if it was available. Um, in terms of the resources that we have on this paste bin, one of the early ones is a post from Bob McElrath on uh, reimagining cold storage with time locks. I don't know if Bob, you want to talk through that post, or and or if you want to point to a different sure, post. Sure, I can give a yeah. I can give a brief description. Um, so this was published shortly after uh, Gunsayer et al. Uh, published their paper on covenants, and uh, it was again around the time that the time lock opcodes came out. Sorry to um, interrupt, Bob. Uh, can yeah. we just no can problem. Jeremy? Can you stop sharing your screen? Um, and then Bob, I don't know if are you happy to share your screen or would you rather just, uh, stay? I don't really have anything I want to show. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Just, okay. Uh, continue. Okay. Sorry. For um, so basically at the time, um, was before CTV was, uh, before Jeremy had the idea to do CTV and, um, so there, there was no kind of covenant mechanism. There have been about five different covenant mechanisms which have been proposed, none of which are active today on Bitcoin. And these are all kind of covered in the talk that I gave, uh, and there are probably more. Um, so the, the only thing that was actually available when we started our project uh, over a year ago was uh, deleting keys. And um, there, so, so that was that's what that post was about. Uh, so using... Um, time locks. Uh, so there's historic precedent for this. So back in the old days, like in the old West, uh, people would create a bank vault with a physical time lock on it, right? So in other words, the bank operator goes home at midnight or, you know, goes home at, you know, 6 p.m. or whatever, locks the vault such that a robber can't get into the vault at night while he's, you know, away. So this is a physical example of a time lock. And so at the time, time locks had just come out and, you know, kind of enabled uh, some of these use cases. And Basically, the picture for uh, the vault use case is that there are two spending branches, one of which is time locked, one of which is not. Um, the time locked branches is basically your normal operation. Uh, now, this is uh, exactly opposite to the way Lightning works. Um, you basically want to enforce a time lock on your funds such that you yourself can't spend it uh, except uh, until you know, let's say 24 hours passes. So there is uh, an unvault operation. So you have to take your funds uh, and you have to unvault them. Uh, in the case of CTV or something like that, you're broadcasting the redemption transaction, or uh, you know if you've deleted keys, you're broadcasting a pre-signed transaction. In the case of the revault, they don't use um, deleted keys, but they do make a big multi-sig and they pre-sign this transaction. Um, once you've the, the whole point of that blog post was that once you've done that, the the signed transaction or the CTV script. Um, is a vaulted object. And I can then figure out, okay, what do I do with that vaulted object? How do I move it around? Where do I store it securely? When do I broadcast it? 
And this signed, signed transaction is of somewhat lower risk than uh, bare private keys. Um, as I mentioned, there are two, two spending paths, right? So one is time locked and the second is not time locked, but it has a different set of keys in it. And that is your emergency backout condition. And the point of the whole vault construction is that if somebody gets into your wallet um, and they get the bare keys, uh, they will presumably get the ones that are time locked, right? And uh, if you see them, you know, unvault one of your transactions, you know that a thief has gotten in and uh, you can go get the, the second branch of keys out of emergency cold storage uh, and use those to reclaim the funds before the thief can get the funds. Uh, Bob, hold on, hold on. No, we shouldn't be recommending sense? that. We, we should not be recommending that. Instead, um, always- I'm describing fun. what the blog post says. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're, but we shouldn't recommend we'll that. We'll discuss we reasons always, why. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. You can always pre-sign a push transaction instead of having to go to your cold storage to get keys out. That's That's, yeah, I mean, that's the obvious answer. Sorry, Brian, say again, I didn't understand that. I mean, you're, you're saying uh, you go to cold storage when there's a problem and you use the keys to sign something to fix the problem, but really you should have a pre-signed push transaction pushing to the cold storage keys. Yes. Right. So this starts to get into a lot of design um, as to how do you organize these transactions. Uh, so what Brian is discussing is what we call a push to recovery wallet transaction. Um, that is, uh, the thief has gotten in, I have to do something, and then I'm going to push this to another wallet, right? So now I have three sets of keys, right? So I have the, the spending keys that I want to use, I have um, my emergency backout keys, and then if I have to use those emergency backout keys, I have to have somewhere to send those funds that the thief wouldn't have access to. So uh, these kind of wallet designs uh, end up getting rather complicated rather fast. Uh, I'm now talking about three different wallets, each of which in principle should be multi-sig. You know, and if I do two of three, I'm now talking about three devices. Um, in addition, uh, you know, when this happens, when a thief gets in and, and tries to steal funds, I want to push this transaction. Okay, who does that and how? Um, this implies a, a set of watchtowers as well, similar to lightning watchtowers that look for this event and are tasked with uh, broadcasting a transaction which will send it to my super, super backup wallet. Cool. Thanks. Any any questions or comments? I mean, is there is yeah. there a way to frame? Sorry, it was someone. Yes. I mean, I mean, yeah. really briefly. I mean, one one idea that I'll throw out is that in my email to the Bitcoin Dev mailing list last year, I pointed out that, you know, um, really what you want to do is you want to split up your coins into a bunch of UTXOs and then slowly transfer it over to your destination wallet, one at a time. And if you see that at the destination that something gets stolen. Uh, then you stop broadcasting to that wallet, and you you know you send a cold storage instead. Um, and then the other the other important rule is that you only allow um, by enforcing a, like for example a watchtower rule, only allow one UTXO at a time to be available in that hot wallet. And so um, you know the thief if they steal one they only lose you know if you if you split it up into one hundred and they steal one UTXO then by definition there's like one percent that they've stolen. And then you know, and you stop sending it to the thief. Anyway, slight, slightly different. Um, I guess um, the way Bob calls it is it's a policy recommendation. So there's, there's different designs here. I'm just trying to trying to like logically get it in my mind in terms of like, are there are there certain frameworks that we can like hang the different designs on? Uh, I know there's the post we'll, we'll get onto your post on the mailing list, Brian. We obviously Kevin got a different design. Bob seemed to be talking about uh, an earlier design. Like, how how do I structure this inside of my head in terms of the different options? And are they just all going to be personalized uh, for specific situations? So, so I think uh, the way that I've been thinking about it is in terms of like what the base layer components are, um, and. I think that in a vault, um, essentially what you're looking at is uh, an annuity. So you're, you're setting up a fixed contract that has some timing condition on every, uh, you know, like next payment. And at the, at the base layer of, of let, let's say most good vault designs, there are some that you would do something a little bit different. This is what you're working with. And um, the value flows along that path. Um, and at any point you can cancel the annuity. And if you cancel it, the amount remaining goes back somewhere else. Um, or, uh, you know, you can, uh, spend the amount that's been redeemed so far. 
and everything else uh, exists as either basically like key policies on who can take those pathways um, or as uh, policies on if you observe certain conditions, which actions you should take. So those exist at a higher order of logic. Uh, th does that maybe help a little bit? It does, yeah. Because you can... Because like, like that backbone exists in, I think, all of these proposals. It's just whether or not you're using multi-sigs or you're using uh, push to recover or you're using, um, like, you know, signing paths for, for the, you know, cold storage, you know, cancel path. Let's go to Kevin. Yeah, so another one, I think, of the important uh, thing is what is doable today and what's not. Um, so, of course, the kind of vault that, for example, Revolt describes or uh, the work that the other guys are doing um, is practical today, as in, like, you don't need to change Bitcoin to make it work. But, of course, we're very far from having a properly, like, blockchain-enforced um, covenant. So we have to kind of use some tricks around it with, like, either deleting private keys or, for us, um, we use, like, co-signing servers and things like that which are very far from being perfect, um, but at least we can somewhat emulate the fact that um, basically the, the output is kind of predefined or agrees to follow some certain rules. Um, so yeah, that's also one of the things. So the, the early papers on covenants um, usually required a new opcode, and that is, I mean, it is a big problem. Who is going to work on creating an implementation of that if you don't even know if the opcode is going to be added to Bitcoin? And also that's what Jeremy is facing right now is like working really hard and it's been a few years on his upcode, uh, but you still have this uncertainty. When is it going to be added? Is it going to be six months? Is it going to be two years? Is it going to be five? Um, and it's really hard when you are like trying to push an idea like Vault, um, especially like for businesses and other things like that, where you require also to work a lot on the implementation itself because it's a security product. Um, if you rely on assumptions like, is this specific upcode going to be added? Or are there going to be some major changes to my BIP that might, you know, break my implementation? Um, so for me, yeah, there is also this like separation between what can be done today practically, even if it's not perfect, uh, versus like what would be the perfect way of doing it, where like everything is enforced by Bitcoin itself. So, so I think that that's a super useful distinction. Um, to, to, to be drawing because it's definitely like looking at like what the trust models I, I, I do think though at, at the same time and, and uh, I think Brian has like you know sort of a public confirmation of this idea is that the way that check template verify and like multi-sig and pre-signed and key deletion interact is, is they're all basically perfectly interoperable so you can you can have a, a system with minimal changes between a and b where you're using one or the other security models. Uh, so, so like that distinction, uh, if you're building out a, a thing, I, I don't necessarily think that it's a um, a differentiator in that uh, all of these protocols, like if check, like, I mean, feel free to disagree, but I think if check template verify were available, this conversation wouldn't be happening. We'd all just agree that check template verify was like the easiest thing to work with, uh, for you know, for this goal. I mean, there might be some questions around fees. But um, I, I, I think that that's like sort of the design space. And then the question between Revault and between, um, uh, I, I, don't, I, I still don't know what the team name is for you guys, but the team um, uh, is uh, really around just, do you prefer pre-signed deleted keys or do you prefer a multi-sig server? And, and I think that, that ultimately is a user, is it's just a user preference. Like that should be a checkbox of like, if you've got to choose between pre-signed and multi-sig server, like which one do you prefer? Well, you know, an, another interesting way to distinguish that even further is that for um, secure key deletion, uh, that works really, really well when it's like a user is the primary beneficiary. It, it works less well when it's a group of like mutually distrusting parties. Well, yeah, you, well, you run into or, serious problems with, for instance, like audits. How do, how do I prove right, right. that the vault exists and you basically can't? Uh, no, I, I think uh, I think everybody on this call would agree CTV is the best solution here. Um, and one of the things I, I know Jeremy's been very frustrated because we've been working on this for a long time. And one of the things I would like to see happen is everybody's 
basically hedging their bets. You know, as Kevin just said, he's like, well, maybe we'll get this, maybe we won't, and maybe we'll just go a different direction because we're not sure. It would be terribly fruitful if everybody on this call, one way or another, could get behind these ideas. Um, you know, there's been very little response to Jeremy's work. I think there are no responses to Brian's post on the mailing list. Um, and we, you know, all gotta gotta get together and say that we want this or not, right? Um, so about that, actually, I mean, I know this has been an issue for a lot of us, including Jeremy, just, you know, getting public feedback and review um, and interest. Um, I would state from my email, there's been a lot of private feedback and like conversations like this, and they just don't show up on the mailing list because none of us can be bothered to go write the same things twice, um, which is a bit of an issue um, and, a, and a little bit of a pet peeve of mine. It would be wonderful if there was only a single place we had to check to see the latest updates on things. Yeah. But, um, it creates a perception that no one cares because there's no responses, right? And I think that's definitely not the case. Um, but we need to rally around something one way or another. I mean, maybe it's just a site like Jeremy's for utxos.org, but for vaults. And then at least there's like a centralized place where you keep going for updates. But um, but I, but but the big the the big thing hanging over all of this conversation is that I don't think there's too many people that want to discuss future soft forks until Taproot's done. Right? Uh, people are so busy on getting Schnorr and Taproot in, and nothing else is going to be getting into that soft fork, and that's still like a long way off. And so that's that's the big question mark. Yeah, like I, whether people have I, the time. I think that that's a pretty big mistake, and maybe this is something as a community we can we can work on. Uh, you know, with this group of people, I think we could we could really make an impact on this. Is like Taproot's having a lot of changes still. It's like still like not a very like stable proposal, and, and that, that's not like Taproot is is great, and I really want to see it, but like that's just the reality. Like you know, there are changes that happened like a week or two ago for the signature algorithm that are being proposed. There are changes to, um, you know, like the the point selection of if it's even or square, uh, and so it's just like I the the horizon is kind of perpetually looking like a year out on it being like a locked down document. I do, you know, I know that Check Temple Verified has not had the level of review that Taproot has had, but it's substantially simpler, and so I don't think that it really requires any changes at this point. So I I do think if we had a concerted push towards getting it reviewed. And slotted for for rollout, like there's no there's no formal schedule for when changes have to deliver in Bitcoin. It's like they can they can be soft worked out when they're ready. And I think that that's just the question is if we have a room of like five people who are all saying like our lives would be made easier if we had check template verify, then like let's let's get it done, you know. The argument against that though is that it would be rushed to try and get it in before tap. Perhaps like all efforts towards Taproot and then uh, future soft forks once Taproot's in. Why though? Like, like what 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 value is? So I mean, so, this is a question that I have for. So Jeremy, other... I mean, one, one answer is is like one conceptualization of Bitcoin Core review capacity is that it's like a single mind's eye, and we can only very slowly move together and carefully examine things all at once. Um, I think that I think that there there is value to that that you know we only have so much uh, you know like focus capacity. Uh, I would make the suggestion that if that's the case, then we did taproot in the completely wrong way, and we really should have done Schnorr and Mast as like two separate things so that we can check mark progress along the way, um, it, rather than sort of like an all at once bolus that's going to take years to roll out because there's other stuff that's important work to 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 get done. And this is my question for, you know, vault implementers, um, you know, generally, like, I think vaults is like one of the most compelling new use cases for Bitcoin that that is going to dramatically improve user security. And my question is, does Taproot or Check Template Verify do more for like the practicality of you being able to deliver vaults to your users? And like, well, how does that use case of in the small case of vaults, maybe, but obviously there's lots of other use cases. There, 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 there's, let's, many, let's, there's many let's, others yep. too. But I think that's a general question, more you know, more rooted in yep. the check template verify side. But like, I think that that's the question, just focused on vaults because we're in the vault section. Like, what is the wish list of things that, in order to make vaults really work better in Bitcoin, like you you need to, need to have, and how can we deliver as as you know the Bitcoin you know community? How can we deliver on those features to to make this like viable? Like if it's not check template verify, I don't care. If it's like we need something else, it's like what are the actual things that we need to be focused on in order to make vaults really work for people? 
Uh, thanks for questions. being patient. Patient. Can we go to Kevin and then Max? Oh, sorry, was that Max first? I'm happy to do. Let's do Kevin first, and we'll do Max after Kevin. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that's not really to answer Jeremy's question, but it might uh, be part of it. Uh, for us, for example, Schnorr Taproot would be a really good improvement already because vaults are not really only so. Sure, maybe if you have a proper covenant, um, you can kind of prevent a theft. Although at some point you need to be able to move your funds to wherever you want. Um, so it's kind of like having a vault is kind of more of a deterrent against an attack um, than a way to completely be in your own bubble where nobody can move funds outside. At some point you will need to be able to move funds outside. Um, so for us, Schnorr and Taproot, for example, is a really, really important thing um, because it would completely hide the fact that we might be using Vault, and it also hides um, some of the defense mechanism, especially around the emergency transactions that uh, Bob also uses. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things I really wanted to cover is that multisig today is cool, but what we can do with Schnorr Taproot is much, much more powerful, and that would be extremely useful for Vault, in my opinion. Okay, we'll go so to Max. By the way, uh, by the way uh, one, one comment about that. The um, When you use Taproot, uh, your time lock script has to be revealed, right? So time lock is an opcode and you have to reveal it. Uh, one of the major benefits of Schnorr is that you can just sign a multisig. So this is great for optimistic protocols like Lightning. Uh, because vaults and the time lock in vaults works in the opposite way, all of your uh, spends have to reveal the tap script that contains the time lock. So you lose a lot of privacy in doing that. Uh, Bob, I, I don't think that that's completely accurate because if you're signing and you're using pre-signs or multi-sig, you sign the end lock time and sequences field without necessarily requiring a uh, check lock time verify enforcement. Okay. Uh, does that does that make sense? Yeah. Because because there are a couple ways to do time but, locks there. Yeah. That, that, like that's the thing with check template verify that's like interesting is like because you have to commit to all the time lock fields you don't need check lock time verify or check sequence verify it's just art automatically committed to oh i see um i see so it's a, it's the same thing if you're doing pre-signs like you don't need those opcodes uh except for if you want to restrict that a certain key can't be used until a certain time well that's exactly it it's restricting that a key can't be used till a certain time yeah can we get to the max can we get to the max I mean, clearly, Taproot is awesome. Uh, CTV is awesome. So wh why not both? Um, could we get CTV as part of the tap script? Um, so the new opcodes that are being introduced with Taproot, could CTV, CTV be one of them? Um, I'm not aware of any new opcodes currently being proposed with tap script. Um, there might be some like with slightly different semantics, like around like the signature stuff um, that I'm not sure of. But it's not like we're adding uh new things there the reason why um in my original proposal for um check output hash verify uh last year about this time i was like oh it looks like tap roots happening soon so let me um just propose it as like using these new extensions and then months went by and taproot didn't seem to be making you know strong headway so i just said okay let me do this as a normal op nop upgrade because it really is not a dependent feature and I think that that's better for Bitcoin, because if you try to say that you will only get check template verify if you accept Taproot is worse for the network being able to independently consider changes. So that that's one reason not to not to layer them. But the, the larger question I think that you're asking is like, why not both? And yeah, let's get both in. Um, I think it's just a question of like on our engineering timelines, what's what's feasible to get done. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it would be. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why I really think that we want to get check template verify like very soon is it does help with congestion. It will take like a year or two for people to deploy those congestion control mechanisms. And we're already seeing a major increase in fees right now. So I think we, we have to be really focused on improving our fee situation. Um, and I, you know, I think Taproot helps a little bit with fees, but the reality is that most users are using very simple keys. Now, hopefully we can change that. Hopefully we'll add more user security. But like right now, like the majority of transactions are not, I don't think materially going to be made more efficient using 
uh, Schnorr taproot because the majority are just simple, you know, single signatures. So uh, I, I, I do, I mean, maybe validation will be faster, but we're not, we're not increasing, you know, capacity or decreasing fees. So I, I think we just need to be doing, doing things in that category. Um, and that, that's why I think that there's some urgency to like do this because, because this is like, I think that this is doable in a month, you know, like I'm not trying to like advocate that timeline, but like, I think that that's the amount of review that like this idea would take for people to like seriously get comfortable with it. Taproot, like I I've reviewed it many times and I'm still not completely comfortable with it. It is just inherently going to take a long time. And to Brian's point of like, if we should have things as like the eye of review is on like a single topic. Like we we need to as a community like only put our eye of review on things that we can more quickly process because if it's all if it's things that are like very very slow to process we're not going to be nimble enough as a project to actually deal with like issues that come up if we're like stuck on things that are like a three year roadmap. I mean, I asked Christian Decker about. Uh, we'll go to Adam next. I asked Christian Decker about Sikash no input, and he was he was very of the opinion that. We don't want to change the proposal now. So, like any any thinking of like adding new stuff in is potentially just going to open up like Pandora's box or like a can of worms, where it just starts all this discussion and disagreement that we kind of want to avoid. But let's go to Adam next. Can you are you there, Adam? You had up. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so, so yeah, it was interesting to hear that discussion um, of motivations, and I'm hearing both, uh, you know, possible security improvements, and and also you're really focused on this congestion control as two sort of practical uh, implications of trying to get this out fairly quickly. Um, I'm curious, though. I mean, the the statement that let's say we got taproot quickly, it would take a long time for it to have any impact on wallets and it probably wouldn't address uh, fees immediately in any realistic sense. I, I can certainly see those arguments, but I'm a bit worried about what does this look like? Suppose that uh, CTV was, was um, deployed uh, today. Uh, what, what are wallets are going to, what are wallets going to have to do to make best use of this congestion control feature i mean you might argue nothing but i, I have a feeling like in practice it's going to be there's going to yeah, be a lot of infrastructure no, um, work it's a lot they, i mean they have to understand yeah. the tree structure right so, uh, so, right. so, so actually that, that's only marginally you know accurate so the for um for it depends on like which wallet you're asking so there's there's two classes of wallet let's look at let's look at uh infrastructural wallets like that would be like a coinbase or a kraken and then user wallets so they both have different requirements so if you look at at infrastructural wallets they have a really hard time changing what mm -hmm. their um like what their internal keys look like so bitmex for example <laughs> still uses uncompressed public keys why they <laughs> wrote a really <laughs> <laughs> they wrote a really great custody engine and what's like is it worth it for them to change the code there it's worked they haven't had a hack of it that uh, that i that i recall uh and if they were to change that then there's risk and risk costs a lot of money so for them they're never like you know like maybe one day they'll get segwit but like they're probably not going to adopt like even these better multi-sig things they're probably not going to adopt it for like a decade so for them changing their um changing their own internal key type is really hard. Changing their output type is actually a little bit less challenging because they're just changing what address they're paying into. So, right. so they've been able to do things like batching um, you know, sooner than they've been able. Batching is much more complicated than SegWit, keep in mind. Batching has a lot of like very weird edge cases that you have to deal with in order for batching to not result in loss of funds, but they've been able to add things like batching. So I think that um, for uh, Check Template Verify, all that it's doing is is at the layer where they decide which transaction they're going to spend to. It's a single new like address that they're going to be paying to to, to cover their liabilities. Now on the receiving end for Check Template Verify, um, users who have existing wallets, those wallets just need to be able to understand uh, in order for this to work like today, uh, they just need to be able to understand an unconfirmed transaction. And I think that most wallets already understand an unconfirmed transaction. Um, and so it should work reasonably okay. 
Uh, and I think that at the exchange, you know, infrastructural wallet layer, um, they can also uh, guarantee uh, some of the execution of of those uh, expansions so that they're just trying to, because if you look at the, um, I think Optech has some good write up of this. If you look at like, if you're willing to wait, um, like, you know, up to like, let's say a day of blocks to get like final confirmation, you can save like 99% on fees. So they can just take that advantage to 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 get the confirmation at the time of request, and then make th they as the infrastructure wallet make the full redemption, uh, you know, like whenever fees are low enough later that day. So I think you will see a, you will see a, like a pretty easy to migrate to benefit without having to have too many changes to either user wallets, which can understand and confirms, in which the processing to fully confirmed can be handled by the exchange. Um, I think that it is easy to deploy um, on like relatively near term. But the more sophisticated use cases absolutely are going to take uh, a longer amount of time. Mm. I mean, for myself, I, I find it a little bit um, unclear. My, my 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 main feeling about it is that it's going to be a struggle to convince the you know the the, the hoi polloi out there of of what exactly is going on here. Because as you say, while it's already understand unconfirmed, if that's all we're talking about, then people would just say, well, why aren't you sending me my transactions quickly enough? Because yeah. as far as most most ordinary users just think. Yeah. Uh, unconfirmed is nothing, and that's why they're generally willing to spend more in fees than they should be willing to spend, because they don't yeah, really yeah. get it, and I don't think they're going to get this either. Um, so, so yeah. I think I think it just depends. Like ultimately, like with this, the only change that the wallets would need to have is to tag things that are observable as a check template verify, you know, like right tree as being confirmed and treat them as confirmed. And that's like a very minimal, like I've made that change for Bitcoin Core's wallet. It took, it's like a 30 minute change. Oh, cool, um, right. You know, so, so it's not that hard. It's just a question of if they have updated software or not of whether it shows up as being fully confirmed or unconfirmed. Um, and, and the, I mean, it is hard to get wallets to upgrade, but it's not, it's not the largest change, um, you know, around. Uh, and, mo and I think it's sort of this weird, you know, like there's this weird curve where like the wallets that are like worse uh, just always spend from unconfirms. So it's not a problem for them. And the wallets <laughs> that are better, you know, separate them out, but also like people who are using those wallets are more likely to maybe receive an upgrade. So I, I think it, I think it, the rollout wouldn't be awful um, for this type of stuff, but you can, um, you know, like it would be like, okay, we go to the exchange, we ask them, hey, why isn't this confirmed? And they say, no, it is. Here's the, you know, here's upgrade your wallet. You'll see it. And, and I think that for users who aren't sophisticated, that's like a sufficient story. Mm. Well, it, it does require um, an additional communications channel between the receiver's wallet and the sender's wallet, right? So the sender has to send uh, the no, tree. No, just, just, just mempool. So if you have the whole tree in, in the mempool, you're saying? Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, yeah, so that. congestion is really for block space. You actually always, uh, well, I mean, unless you have a privacy reason for not showing what the total flow is, you can always just broadcast the transaction and then it will live at the bottom of the mempool. Yep. Um, and so that, that's a fine channel. That's how people learn of transactions right now anyways. Another interesting thing to think about here is that uh, you can ask, well, have wallets in the past upgraded to new features in general? And uh, as I mentioned, the vast majority of transactions out there are pay to pub key hash. Why is that? I mean, even most wallets don't even use um, pay to script hash or multi-sig. Why? And the answer is that um, because everybody who's making wallets is also making shitcoin wallets. And in order to have a uniform experience and uniform key management uh, for, let's say, Ethereum and Bitcoin, they what they did, what they've done is they've gone toward uh, using a single key for everything and adding things on the back end like multi-party ECDSA, so that they so that it's actually multi-sig on the back end. Unfortunately, this dynamic I think isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, and in my experience, very very few vendors um, have implemented some of the more advanced features on on Bitcoin. Unfortunately. Yeah, I think I think that that's uh, that's a great point, and that's one of the things that I'm like worried about for uh, for for Taproot, for example, is that like the actual rollout in wallets is going to be ridiculously slow because mm -hmm. it's going to be a new signing thing, and wallets are already existing with a single seed format. They're not going to want to redrive a new thing. Uh, it, I think it's going to take a very long time for that adoption to pick up for user wallets. That's one thing that's nice with the check table verified rollout is that like all that they have to do is like what they're already doing. And it's just like, like most, most of these wallets already show unconfirmed balance. So, you know, especially the shitcoin ones, like they, they show unconfirmed balance cause they're, you know, they're zero well, the, wallets. 
The, the benefit of using the tree is that you don't have to put it all in the mempool. If I'm just going to put everything in the mempool anyway, I might as well have just not done the tree. Uh, that, the that's, ball, actually, right? that's actually not, not quite true. So the mempool itself, um, what you want to do is you want to keep, like the mempool, you can always broadcast anything that will show up in the mempool somewhere. But what's important to keep decongested is the top of the mempool. So the actual mempool itself, like it's fine to like put these things in and then they get propagated around. And then if the mempool <laughs> backlog grows, they get evicted. That's fine. Like that's an okay outcome. Um, it's that you don't want to be in the situation where you have so much stuff in the mempool that high high value transactions that are that uh, I don't have a great name for it, but like uh, that are completely unconfirmed because like if if their outputs get uh, unspent, they could be double spent. Like those getting kicked out of the mempool is much more problematic for users because when you're a user and something goes in the mempool, you see it, you observe it. If it applies to you, you store it in your wallet, even if it goes in or out of the mempool. So. It's just sort of like it just has to go into some mempool, and most of these uh, wallets already have like um, uh, they already are using like custom like they're 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 not using a mempool on their own wallet. They're using like a mempool on like the server of like whoever's providing the wallet, and those can be configured to like be watching for you know the user's keys or whatever, um, or you're filtering, and they can be configured to be storing you know as much you know it, it, it like the mempool can be like terabytes big. It doesn't need to be a small thing. It only needs to be small if you're a miner, because if you're if it's too big and you're and you're trying to mine, like a big mempool is more problematic. Just a couple of quick things. One, um, if you're speaking, and you're happy to have the video on. Please put the video on, just for the sake of the YouTube. Um, you obviously don't have to. And number two, let's try and steer it back to vaults. Uh, so we'll go to Max next. Uh, but I do want to go on to Brian's mailing list posts on vaults and some other work that's done, been done on vaults. But we we'll go to Max now. Uh, actually, the topic that I wanted to bring up is somewhat obsolete, uh, so we can move on. Thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so before we go on to Brian's mailing list posts, um, there's a couple of uh, people's work that I added to that paste bin. One was uh, Peter Todd's work on single-use seals, and another one was... Christopher Allen's work on smart custody. Um, are any of these of interest to people? Any thoughts on these guys' work? Uh, I just want to. I just want to mention, if I can butt in, uh, how incredibly easy to understand uh, single use seals are. <laughs> can you can you explain uh, them? <laughs> or, or is that a sarcastic comment? Is that some British humor? It was. It was an extremely sarcastic uh, comment. I apologize. Yeah, I, 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 I've I've always found them and their description completely inscrutable. So if somebody feels like they can take a shot at that, uh, that would so, be pretty cool. So apparently RGB is using this in their code, like the, um, <laughs> oh, what is it, the LNPBPS repository or something. OK, so we just read some C++ code, and that'll be easier to understand than the mailing list post. Code is the universal <laughs> language. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I think I can describe it pretty simply, simply, simply but I don't know. It's related to vaults. Um, a single use seal is a you know something you can use once. So if you've ever seen like a tag on your your no, shipping I mean, crate, Bob, Bob uh, we understand what it is. It's just Peter Todd's description of it, how it applies to Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> Peter, Peter Todd's description is inscrutable. I, I agree. Um, like, like, is it just spending a UTXO, and then that's that's all we're talking about? <laughs> yeah, spending UTXO is an example of a single use seal, right? Honestly, you can my only spend my... a UTXO once. Yeah. Right? Oh, oh. Honestly, my sarcasm is 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 one thing, but but I, I do actually think there is something really interesting there. That his whole idea of client side filtering, but but it is pretty abstract. But perhaps perhaps it's not really a topic for today. I'm not sure. And then honestly, I don't know how it relates to the vault topic. So, okay, apologies for that if I'm introducing noise. Uh, but the smart custody stuff that Chris Allen was worked on that's relevant, right? Yeah, I was I was a co-author with uh, Chris Allen on that project. Um, for some of the smart custody book, along with uh, Shannon Applecline and um, a few others, um, and um, yeah, I mean, it, it was basically the idea of like let's put together a worksheet about how to do custody for individuals, how to safely store your Bitcoin using hardware wallets, and you know the sort of planning that you might go through um, to like be just very thorough and make sure you have checklists and understand the sorts of problems that you're trying to defend against. Um, the plan was, and I think it still is the plan, to do a second version of the smartcustody.com work with um, uh, uh, for multisig, which was not covered in the original uh, booklet. 
I, I would love that. One of the things that I that I did, I have some code that I can donate for that is like being is, is generating on your computer a um like a codex which is just like a shuffled uh and then zipped like you know bit whatever uh, word list um and then uh, you take the word list and then you use it as like a, a cipher to like write your seed in like a different set of words and then you give one party your uh, cipher and you give another party the like encrypted word list. And it's sort of like, what's the point of that? It's like, well, you have a seed that's on paper somewhere and now you want to encrypt it and give a copy to, uh, you know, like, you know, two of your friends that you have a recovery option. And I feel like we just don't like having like little tools that like allow people to do that kind of stuff would just be like pretty, uh, pretty nice of being able to generate like completely offline, um, like, you know, backup keys and things like that to like shard out keys to, to people. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'll definitely give a shout out. I'd definitely send that to Christopher Allen. Um, he also has a air gapped signing uh, Bitcoin wallet based off of um, a stripped down iPod touch with a camera and a screen for QR codes. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. That's actually on blockchain commons GitHub. So that's out there. Cool. So let's go on to your mailing list post then, Brian. Uh, so there's two, there's uh, this was August's uh, Bitcoin Vaults with anti theft recovery. And then there was another one, April on Chain so, Vaults prototype. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's good news, actually. So there was actually three. There was two on the first day. And while the first one is somewhat interesting, um, it's actually wrong. And you should focus on the second one that occurred on that same day, which was the one that quickly said, um, uh, Aaron Van Worden uh, pointed out that this is insecure and the adversary can just wait for you to broadcast an unlocking transaction and then steal your funds. And I was like, yes, that's true. So the, the solution is the sharding, which I talked about earlier today. Uh, basically, the idea is that if someone is going to steal your money, you want them to steal less than 100% of your money. And you can achieve something like that with with um, with vaults. Cool. Anybody else uh, read Brian's mailing list posts or any thoughts? Let's go to Kevin. Yeah, I think something else really interesting in it is that um, Brian also takes the path of um, deterring an attack um, by the recursiveness. Um, I think, Brian, in the last step, you always burn the funds, although maybe it's not always. But uh, well, I mean, only, it's pretty cool. It's only if you're in an adversarial situation, but yes. Yes, of course. Wait, yeah. OK, so I, I think it's really cool because the whole point of, of this type of approach is really not to be um, like bad on the user, but really to be hard to steal. So to kind of deter the attack in the first place. Any other thoughts? Uh, we got consensus to uh, to share the uh, figures if you'd like, just to make it easier to to see. Let me, let me share oh, for the okay. So, Sam, by the way, my vault implementation is actually not the same as the as the version um, being implemented at Fidelity. Okay, so let me so let me just hold off. Yeah, it's actually a totally different <laughs> implementation. Um, there's some similarity, um, but yeah, I, I admit this is actually very confusing. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, to help disambiguate, so there's, there's like four different vault implementations flying around at the moment, or five. Um, Jacob on the call here, uh, he has his own little implementation as well, so that's like number five. And then, oh, and then Jeremy has his, that's number six. And then like the others are like, there's mine, and there's um, the one at Fidelity, um, based off of secure key deletion and also some hardware wallet prototypes. And then there's Kevin's revault. And then I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting one at this point. OK. And yeah, there's, so there's there's a lot going on. And, and I'm assuming some of them are going to be very, very specific to a certain use case, right? I mean, I don't know what's going on at Fidelity. But uh, like perhaps they have special requirements that uh, other, other uh, custodians just wouldn't have. Uh, let's go to Spencer next. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I can actually speak to what we're doing at Fidelity, um, just because this is what I'm working on. So 
um, as, 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 as you may know or, or may not know, uh, I believe January of 2019, we, we released um, FDAS, which is Fidelity Digital Asset Services. Uh, so it's for it's it's custodianship for uh, institutional clients, but actually the the deleted key vault that we're working on is open sourced and looking at a the route. Um, so we do have a work uh, a work in progress implementation on our public facing GitHub page. Uh, it's FRMR LLC, and there's a series of repos, um, but the the interesting part is the Vault embed repo, which is currently under uh, refactoring. Um, so we're not necessarily looking at um, you no know, extra extra functionalities at the moment. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that someone may have. Cool, thank you. Can you uh, can you send a link to that in the yes, chat? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, so the next resource is Brian's uh, Python vaults repo, uh, which, as far as I can understand, is one of those particular implementations um, in Python. So I'm assuming this is like a toy proof of concept type thing? Or, or... Yes, yes, this is definitely proof of concept. Don't use it in production. Um, but I mean, the purpose was to demonstrate that this could all work to get some sample transactions and actually use them against Bitcoin reg test mode or something. And it works and um, I'm definitely open to review and feedback about it. Um, one of the interesting things in there is that there is both a version, um, which is default that uses secure key deletion or pre-sign um, yeah, pre transaction where you delete the key, but then also um, an implementation using BIP 119 object template verify as well. Um, interesting note, and Jeremy has been polite enough not to bring it up. Uh, Jeremy's version in in his, uh, I guess, branch of, um, I guess, core is uh, substantially more concise, and I'm a little confused about that. Uh, what are what are you confused about? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure why mine isn't as concise as yours. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I, I think I probably benefit a lot from having implemented it in core because um, you have access to like all the different, you know, bits and bobs of like core functionality, um, you know, around like wallet signing and stuff like that. Um, but it, it, it actually is kind of interesting, um, you know, you know, point is, uh, let, let me find a link just so I can, I can send out this implementation to people. Um, but um, I was trying to um, think about how I write this as like a template meta program so that I have like all of these recursion things uh, like handled in terms of like, here's a class that like attaches to another class and there's subclasses. And I think that that's sort of um, a nice model. And I actually spent a little bit of time trying to make like a template meta programming language for C++ um, that allows you to write like all different types of smart contracts. But I really hit a wall with that. So what, what I've actually built now is a, uh, and this is setting up for, I guess, a big punchline is like, I've, I've built out this like smart contracting language that I've been trying to hype a little bit. It's called Sapio. It's not released yet, but hopefully, you know, soon I'll get it out there. And if you think that the implementation that I have in, uh, in core is concise, wait till you see this one. It, this one's like 20 lines of code, and then you have the whole thing. Um, all right, you know, so we're it's, playing, it's, some, playing some golf, I guess. Okay. It, it's it's 20 lines of code and then thousands of lines of compiler. <laughs> so, you know, there, there's a trade off there, but I'm hoping that the compiler that, that I'm working on will be general purpose. And I think that this is something that, um, you know, I, I'd love to follow up later with everybody who's working on vaults because I think uh, I think everybody's vaults actually probably can be expressed uh, as programs in this language. Uh, and you'll probably save a lot of lines of code, and then maybe we can put communal effort on the things that are, uh, you know, the same across all implementations. Things like um, how do you, uh, you know, like add signatures and things like that. Um, how do you, you know, template those out? How do you write the PSBT final ISOs? All, all that kind of stuff is like general logic. Oh, um, I, I'm happy to answer nothing much as question. Do you want to like say it aloud? Uh, sure. Uh, nothing much says, can you describe this language briefly? How does it compare to say Ivy or Miniscript? Um, so, so it's using, it's, it's a check template verify based language. Um, and you can plug out, um, the check template verify with, uh, 
emulated either like uh, single party pre-signed or you can have uh, like a multi-signature thing. So that's where like, I think that's just the security model that you're willing to do. And if you have the feature available or not. Um, but Ivy and Miniscript are key description languages. And so they operate at the level of saying, uh, you know, in, in a metaphor, like, uh, what's my house key? What's my car key? What's my bus pass? What's my office key? This language operates at the level of commutes. And so you say, I leave my house, I lock my door, I go to my car, I unlock my car, I start my car, I drive to my office, and then I unlock my office, or I walk to the uh, train station, I take the train, I walk to my office, then I unlock the office. So it's describing the value flow, not just like a single instance of an unlocking. Ivy and Miniscript describe single instances of unlocking. This language is a uh, Turing complete metaprogramming language that emits lists of Bitcoin transactions um, rather than emitting a, a uh, script. So it emits lists of transactions rather than a script. That's that's a little bit of a handful, but uh, that's that's the succinct version. Okay, cool. Uh, nothing much says thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to put a ten minute like hard limit on, and then we'll we'll wrap up in the next ten minutes. Um, just to bridge to next week's presentation with Kevin and Antoine, I perhaps thought we could discuss uh, Revolt. Um, and Kai Aaron tried to do this in the interview with Kevin and uh, Anton, which was kind of like tease out the differences between Revolt and some of the other Vault designs, such as Brian's and Fidelity's and all sorts. So I don't know, probably best to go to Kevin at this point. Yeah, sure. Um, all right. So yeah, well, to start with Revolt, I think the the main thing is really that when we started it, um, we started with the with a threat model that is different, uh, and also the situation that is different. So it was for a multi-party situation um, where we have a set of participants um, kind of being the stakeholders, and then the subset of participants um, for this specific client, at least um, that were doing the day-to-day -day movement of funds. Um, so just as an idea to explain you a little bit more clearly, um, they are a hedge fund. Um, so there are different participants in the hedge fund, but they are only a subset that are traders. Um, the threat model includes internal threats, like the two traders trying to steal the money of the fund. Uh, and this is also something quite new, or at least not well covered in other proposals until now. Um, hopefully we will see more soon. Um, so yeah, there is the external threat model that basically a multi-sig covers. Then you have the internal threat model. So these two signatures are not enough for the two traders because you want also to include the other ones as some kind of um, reviewers of transaction or whatever you want to call them. Um, and then of course there is the main threat um, for most companies and people today in Bitcoin, which is the physical threat, like somebody coming to you, the $5 wrench attack or this kind of stuff. Um, we are quite lucky to not have too many of those. But when you look at the security that, for example, exchanges are using today, uh, you'd be really surprised to see like five, 500 million or even a billion uh, USD worth of Bitcoin being secured just behind a you know single key. Um, so if you find the right people to threaten, then you might be able to steal the funds, which is like super scary. So we're trying to address that kind of stuff. Um, yes, so what else can I explain? Oh, yeah, also another difference is that because it's for business operations, we are trying to reduce the hassle of using it. Um, because as you know, most security things kind of are defeated if it's complex to use, people are going to bypass it. Um, which is also very problematic. So you want the traders to be able to do their job. Um, if every time they are doing a transaction, they have to ask their boss if it's okay to move the funds uh, and to check everything like the destination address and the amount and everything, then it's never going to be used. Um, they are going to bypass it somehow. Um, so we're trying to move the validation from being um, some kind of a verification after the transaction is created to the opposite. So when the funds enter, so when somebody deposits money to this uh, hedge fund or whoever uses Revolt, um, the funds are locked. So they are locked by default. Then you would need all these stakeholders. So in my example, it's four to pre-sign the set of transactions to be able to move them. So by default, they are locked. Um, and then you can kind of 
enable the spending by having everybody um, signing the uh, transactions, being able to move them and revolting them. So in case of an attack, you need to have pre-signed transaction to, to put them back in the vault. Um, and then after that, the spenders, so the two traders are able to craft a transaction that of course will be time locked. So you will have a delay before it's mined um, where a different, like different conditions can be triggered to revolt the transaction if something is wrong. So that could be either enforced by the stakeholders, that could be third parties like watchtowers um, and other things like that. Um, of course, it's more complex than that because we are really trying to emulate something like CTV um, with the tools we have today. So it's not really simple. Um, also, personally, I'm not fond of um, deleting private keys. So secure key erasure is not something I really like. Um, so personally, I'm trying to avoid this um, in the design. In the end of the day, it creates other problems. So yeah, uh, we are kind of having to use a, a co-signing server today, which is not cool. Uh, or co-signing servers uh, in plural. I don't know yet exactly how we will implement that properly um, or if we can remove it. So Antoine, who is not on the call today, um, is actively working on trying to remove this uh, co-signing server, but that might mean that we are moving towards a secure key deletion as well. So we, I, I think it's a trade-off and you have to kind of see um, what kind of risk you want to take because like secure key deletion creates other burden around like backups because you need to backup every pre-signed transaction um, and things like that. So yeah, I I kind of hope it's a, it's a good primer. Um, I don't know if you have any question, but um, yeah, it would take a long time to dig into it, I think. So the few main differences that you talked about in that podcast with Aaron is, like multi-party architecture rather than single party. Uh, there was something else around, oh, pre-signing the derivation tree, depending on the amount. Oh, so, because Brian's implementation, you need to know the amount in advance. Um, yeah, uh, so, actually, on, yeah. That, um, on that, it's, it's, yes, so the way the original um, architecture from Brian from last year, um, yes, so the funds are not in the vault before you know exactly how much money you want to, how much Bitcoin, how many Bitcoin you want to secure. So you have to pre-sign all your tree and then you move the funds in. And from that time, the funds are protected. Um, so of course that is not usable in normal business operation, or at least you would have to consider a step before that where your deposit address is not part of the vault system. So it's doable. You can, you can do a system like that. It's not a problem. It's just that it's not part of the vault before pre-signing the transaction um, because of the deleted private keys and things like that. So we don't have this problem. Um, our funds are secure as soon as they enter. But yeah, different trade-offs. Uh, trade and then I do want to touch on, just before we wrap up, I do want to touch on the last link, I think, which is the one uh, Bob wanted me to add on. Uh, Antoine's mailing list post on mempool transaction pinning problems. So I think, is this potentially a uh, weakness of your design, Kevin, or does Bob have, have any thoughts on this, if Bob's still here? Uh, still here. I think Jeremy's probably the best to respond to that because he's actively working on this. Uh, yeah, I mean, all I can say is uh, we're all fucked. <laughs> 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 I, I mean, uh, you know, the... Like, I would like there to be, like, it would be great if there was, like, a story where, like, oh, yeah, one of these designs is really, like, good in the mempool. It just turns out that the mempool is, like, really messy, and uh, it, it, it's something I'm I'm struggling to find. Like, we need to employ, like, three to five people who are just working on making the mempool work, and there's just not the engineering budget for that. Um, the mempool needs a complete re-architecting, and it doesn't work in the way that anybody expects it to work. Um, in you know, like you, you think that the mempool is supposed to be doing one, you know, layer of functionality, but the, the reality is the mempool touches uh, everything. So the mempool is there in validation, it's there in uh, transaction relay and propagation, and it's there in mining. And it needs to function in all of those different contexts. It needs to function quickly and performantly. And so what you end up getting is you end up getting situations where you get pinned. And what pinning means is the mempool has all these denial of service protections built into it. 
that it won't look at or consider transactions. And the mempool, because it's a part of consensus, the mempool is not what it what it sounds like. It's not a dumb list of memory that just stores things. It's actually a consensus critical data structure that has to store transactions that could be in a valid block and has to be able to produce a list of transactions that could go into a valid block. And because of that, you really tightly guard how complicated the, the chains of transactions that can get into the mempool are. And so people have issues where they'll do something that's slightly outside of those bounds and they're relying on the mempool being able to accept a transaction for, um, uh, you know, for a lightning channel, let's say. And because the mempool is really quite big, you have things that are low fee at the bottom that can preclude a new high fee transaction coming in, which, which prevents you from like redeeming a lightning channel, which means that you're going to lose money, especially for lightning, especially for cross chain atomic swaps. And what's, what's annoying about this is it's, it's because of the way that UTXOs are structured, this can be somebody who's completely unrelated to you spending from some like change address of a change address of some other long chain. So any of these designs is just like inherently, if you have pending transactions, you're going to have uh, a really hard time with this stuff. Um, I would like I would like to say that like we have a plan for making the situation like completely addressed. Bcash actually did deal with this. They got rid of child pays for parent, and they have like unlimited block size. And it turns out if you do those two things, like you kind of stop having a lot of these denial of service issues. So like. You know, like I, I don't think that that's like viable for Bitcoin at this point, but it's like not even the worst option among among options that are like possibly going to be a thing. So I, I think we just need to invest a lot more engineering effort in trying to see what we can where, where we can elevate the mempool into, because it, it is the type of issue that people look for carve outs, little things that they can that they can make their niche application work. Lightning did this one time with the Lightning carve out, which which prevents pinning in a certain use case. Six months later, they found out that that doesn't actually solve all the problems. And I don't think it's going to be a carve out thing that we're going to be able to fix some of these pinning issues. It's just going to be a, like we've completely re-architected the mempool, able to handle like a much broader set of, of use cases and applications. So I'm, I'm a little bit uh, negative on, on like the prospects of the mempool working really well. Um, and I think that's just like the, the reality. Um, I'm working on it. So I'm not just complaining. Like I, I I'm, have like 30 outstanding PRs worth of work, but nobody's reviewed my, you know, first, you know, the second PR for like two months. So it's just not going to happen if people aren't putting the engineering resource on it. That that's the reality. Okay, we do need to close out. Uh, let's try and make it a little more uh, optimistic ending. Uh, Block Digest has a question on YouTube. Uh, what are Brian's or anybody's thoughts on the watchtower requirement here? I see a path of either bundling watchtowers for many services for separate services. Which way of handling? Uh, does Brian or anybody else think it's best long term? Um, you know what? I'll, I'll probably hand this off to Bob or Jeremy about watchtowers. I mean, yeah, it's a huge problem. The prototype that I put together did not actually include a watchtower, even though it's absolutely necessary. It's really interesting. One, one comment I made to Bob, actually, is that vaults have kind of revealed things that we should be doing with normal Bitcoin wallets that we just don't do. Everyone should be watching um, their coins on chain at all times, but most people don't actually do that um, In vaults it becomes absolutely necessary But is that really a property of vaults or is that actually a normal everyday property of like how to use Bitcoin that we've mostly been ignoring? I don't know snaps for that <laughs> um, yes, so there are many uses for watchtowers, and I think uh, as time goes on, we're going to see more. Uh, another use for watchtowers, which has come up recently, is the state change discussion. Um, so Tom Trevathan uh, posted a, a ECDSA-based state chain, which I think is pretty interesting. It also has the requirement for watchtowers. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a method to transfer UTXOs, and what you want to know is, did a previous holder of the UTXO broadcast his uh, redemption transaction, and how can you deal with that? Uh, Yes, I, I think there is a path here to combine all of these ideas, but I think there's so much uncertainty around it that we we currently wouldn't know how to do it. Um, you know, there are multiple update mechanisms, state update mechanisms in uh, Lightning, and that's still in flux. You know, once you start to add in vaults and then you know state chains as different me different mechanisms with different uh, ways to update their state, um, yeah, there's going to be a wide variety of uh, watchtower needs. Um, and then you get to things like, okay, so now I want to pay a watchtower. 
Um, is, is the watchtower service I pay for, uh, can it be decentralized? Can I you know, open a lightning channel and pay a little bit over time so I can make sure this guy is still watching my watchtower? How do I get guarantees that uh, he is still watching my, my transactions for me? Um, there's a lot of design space there that I think is, is largely unexplored. I, I think it's a terribly interesting thing to do if anybody's interested. I think part of the issue is we're trying to solve too many problems at once. Like the reality is we don't even have a good watchtower that I'm operating myself and that I fully trust. And that should be the first step. Cause like we, we don't even like we don't even have the code to run your own server for these things. And, and and that just has to be like where you start. And then we're and then I agree longer term, yes, outsourcing makes sense. But like for for sophisticated contracts, like we, we need to at least have something that that does this functionality that you can run yourself. And that and then we can figure out these higher order constraints. But we're trying to, I think, put the cart before the horse on like the um like you know, completely functional watchtowers that are, that are bonded and, you know, that, that stuff can come later. Yeah. And, and I think the, the first order thing to solve is how do you do the state update mechanism? You know, we are still uh, not decided whether we're going to get L2 um, and SIG has no input. And that, you know, that implies a different update mechanism and a different set of transactions that need to be watched. So, you know, that conversation doesn't seem to be settling down anytime soon. Uh, it seems like we're not going to get no input anytime soon. Um, I don't know. Th there's just a lot of uncertainty. Okay, I'm going to put a five-minute hard limit. Uh, we'll go Kevin next, uh, but we're going to wrap up in five minutes. Yeah, for the watchtowers, I'm not as skeptical as uh, as you guys, I think, um, for multiple reasons. But one of them is that um, anybody could be working on watchtowers today or have even watchtowers in production, and we would not know about it, uh, which is one of the cool things of watchtowers is that it might like it behaves as if it has a private key, but it doesn't have it. It has a, a, a pre-signed transaction instead. Um, another thing regarding like hosting it yourself or giving it to other people or having you know a third-party watchtower, um, I think it's a good thing that um, you should actually have a lot of these. Like, of course, you should have one or multiple watchtowers yourself. Um, but you should also deal with third parties. You might have to pay them, of course, uh, Bob, you're right on that. Um, but the fact that you might, or at least you should have a lot of watchtowers and nobody knows how many you have is really important in terms of security um, because at least they don't know where, or if there is a single point of, fa of failure, they don't know if uh, it's a vector of uh, DDoS. Um, you know, they don't know who to attack uh, to prevent transaction to be sent to a protection mechanism or, or trigger a protection mechanism. So I'm really bullish on watchtowers and I know a few people are working on them and I'm really looking forward to, to see them in production. Okay, should we wrap up? Does anyone want to have the last word before I wrap up? Um, Michael, I guess the transcript stuff might be um, an interesting question to run by the group. Oh, what, what specifically? I was going to... Well, just curious uh, about ideas about, I mean, it. I don't know, just, just informing them that I'm trend, I'm I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> I'm, I don't have enough time. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm handing uh, it off to people, uh, trying to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So long, Wait, so so long so, and thanks for all the fish. Yeah, yeah, basically. So in terms of transcripts, yeah, uh, I'm doing a lot more transcripts than Brian these days because obviously Brian's very busy with his CTO role. Uh, if you want to follow new transcripts, follow BTC Transcripts on Twitter, and eventually there'll be a site up uh, uh, working on it. Uh, Brian has released the transcript of today, I think for the first half. Uh, we'll get that cleaned up and uh, add any content, content that's missing from the second half, so that we'll get that up as well. Uh, but apart from that, I think the only thing is to say thank you very much for everyone attending. That was really, really interesting. And if you want to hear more about vaults, Kevin and Antoine are presenting next week. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you. Thanks. Good night here from thank London. You. Thank you. Yep. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.